No, it's not about passion. Look at the facts and look at the evidence. This is where a juror sometimes will get in trouble. Speculation. They start guessing or speculating about evidence that we never talked about. Witnesses who never testified. So don't, don't speculate. Other evidence that you never heard of. Other evidence that someone may have mentioned but it was never introduced. Don't speculate about what that would be. Attorneys. This is not about the attorneys. This is, I like that attorney. I don't like that attorney. It's not about that. And I know you're not going to buy it. It's not about the defendants and the defendant. Uh, how do I balance things out? It's not about that. What can a jury, a fair and impartial juror, consider? Well, consider what's in the circle. The elements of the crime. You're going to get a copy of those jury instructions, and it's going to tell you what elements that people have to prove for murder and for the special circumstance of lying in wait and all the other uh, crimes. Testimony of witnesses. You know, there, there's a reason why this witness stand is so close to the jury. And so you can be close enough to watch their demeanor while they understand. How do they respond to the questions of attorneys? You can hear their voice. Do they answer right away? Do they hesitate? When Robert Koshlan testifies that Amy was this amazing person, is he just making that up? When he says, the reason I talk to people is because I want people to know about her, not just that she was someone's fiance. There's more to her than that. So you judge the credibility of witnesses. Exhibits. You're going to get all those exhibits we introduce in front of the jury. You're going to have uh, those back there so you can review them, including the videotapes, the ring videos, what have you. The law. You're going to have the law. Remember you all said one thing when we were selecting a jury. We will follow the law as given to us by the court. And this is why you're going to convict them of burglary, of murder in the first degree, and the special search of lying in wait when he committed this murder. Co logic and common sense. Aside from the law, you know what happened here. This is not a defendant who was uh, depressed and the depression made him go get nicotine, made him go get gloves, made him cover up cameras, made him wait for three to four hours. No. Logic and common sense. That's why you're going to go guilty on all these charges. What is the truth? Well. Truth is not just because I'm telling you what it is. The truth is, who do the witnesses corroborate? Paramedics. Michael Herman. Her text messages about fearing this defendant, what he was going to do to her. What? The evidence corroborates only one reasonable interpretation. That he broke in with the intent to kill her. Does the defendant have a motive? Or, or is this someone just just got picked up from the street and the police officers are blaming this person? No. You have those text messages. You have their interaction at x -Biz. You have the anger he had. Physical evidence. The ring videos, his DNA at the location. One out of a septillion, that's him. But, but you also have the ring video showing that it's him. Yet we spent so much time on different questions on, on these witnesses. Amy's injuries tell you a story of how he beat her. Not a struggle, a beating. They're not, you know, the same size and weight. They're not like fighting it out. Statements by a defendant that incriminate him. I just interneted your phone. Whatever he's telling other people uh, on those recordings, those jail visits. Whatever he's saying in front of those people at the ex -biz. You ruined my life, bitch. The reasonable interpretation of circumstantial evidence. So this is an important instruction. Direct and circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is like we had a witness right there that saw them do it. Right? We don't have that. You know? In most crimes, you're not going to have necessarily a witness who sees the crime on the third floor <laughs> of this bedroom committing it. But what you have is circumstantial evidence. Because circumstantial evidence is not directly proven fact to be decided, but it's evidence of another fact, a group of facts, from which one may conclude the truth of the fact in question. For example, videos, physical evidence, defendant's text messages, victim's physical injury. So the circumstances, what do the circumstances tell you about what happened and about defendant's intent? And you know, in the TV, in TV sometimes you hear, all they have is a circumstantial evidence case, as if, as if, as if that's not better than someone identifying someone who could be mistaken about their identification. 
Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable as a means of proof, and neither is entitled to greater weight than the other. So circumstantial evidence is as good as direct evidence. So I would argue sometimes better, because sometimes you can't change the circumstances. You can't change the ring video. You can't change the DNA. You can't change him wearing gloves. You can't change the strangulation marks on her neck. So if there are two reasonable interpretations of the circumstantial evidence, it favors the defendant. However, if there's only one reasonable interpretation, you must reject the unreasonable interpretation that he just went there to talk to her. That he was going to do cause himself some harm. That's not the reasonable interpretation of the circumstances when he's uh, gloved up, covering cameras, breaking into her house. When he breaks in, he has a lethal dose of nicotine. You know what the reasonable interpretation is of the evidence in this case. So you reject unreasonable interpretations that he was there just to talk that he was there to cause himself harm. You know, during this trial, the defense cross-examined various witnesses. And, I, and it, the, my argument to you is this is what the defense basically boiled down to in those questions to witnesses. Shifting blame. He was, during opening statement, Kyle said, defendant was so debilitated after seeing her. Uh, he got into this depression and Amy wouldn't talk to him. But, like, Amy has a responsibility to talk to someone that acts like this? Why didn't the paramedics uh, take her uh, sooner to the hospital? Well, how does that change that you strangled her and that you threw her over the balcony? How does that change that? There's excuse after excuse, as if the defendant is a child. He's a 41-year-old man who couldn't, ha couldn't move on. She blocked him, and for that, you get this? Excuse after excuse. This woman, Amy Harwick, wanted to be left alone. She wanted to be respected. And he didn't do any of that. He didn't respect her boundaries. He didn't care. But the defense makes, and they're questioning a witness, excuse after excuse for him. And you should ask yourself, when you hear these questions that are excuse after excuse for the defendant, how does that change defendant's plan, evidence of his plan? How does that change that he's identified as the killer? How does that change his cover-up? Those text messages to women two hours right before he breaks in, messages to, laughing at text messages of other women within 46 minutes after throwing her over the balcony, how does it change her injuries, the strangulation, the beating? How does that change that? It doesn't. But it is a distraction. It could distract the juror that they keep pointing out issues that they brought up with these witnesses, which really doesn't change what he did. So don't be distracted, ladies and gentlemen. Focus on the actual crime, his actual actions, what he did here. You know, counsel kept asking, well, how about these Nest cameras? Well, they issued a subpoena for the Nest cameras the very next day. And you heard the evidence. They got the videos. They don't show much. Defense counsel just threw it out there. Was there a camera on the, on the third floor? There's no evidence that there was a camera on the third floor or that one was working. So why just plant that for the jury out there? Why not confront a witness and say, is this the camera we're talking about? Are these the videos we're talking about? Don't be distracted, ladies and gentlemen. Focus on the evidence. You are to consider all the evidence in the case. The law. So I'm going to explain the law to you in a moment. Uh, we've charged the defendant with two counts here. Count one is murder. So you're going to decide, did he commit murder? Did he, ki did he kill a human being, Amy Harwood, without justification? You're going to find that it is murder. And then you're going to decide, your next question is going to be, is it murder? All murder starts off as second degree. Is this murder of the first degree? And I'll explain to you what gets you to first degree. It is murder of the first degree. Basically, what gets you to first degree is either it's premeditated and deliberate, meaning you thought about it, you considered it beforehand, or also murder while lying in wait. Did you catch someone off guard when you killed them? After you find that it's murder of the first degree, your next question will be, 
is the, is the special circumstance of lying in wait true? Did he, ca- did he kill her? Did he catch her off guard when he killed her? And the answer is true. The second count is burglary. You can decide, did he break into her home? Is it second degree burglary or first degree burglary? First degree burglary is when you break into someone's residence. It's residential, where someone lives. There'll be a special allegation. Was there a person present when he broke in? Yes. We all know that Michael Herman was present. So you're going to find this true. And that's it. Murder defined. A human being was killed, Amy Harwick. The killing was unlawful. And the killing was done with malice of forethought. This language, malice of forethought. doesn't mean, it means he thought about it beforehand. In other words, it didn't just happen in that second. It was thought before that. I want you to, cause of death. There's an instruction that defines your cause of death. And that causes death if the death is direct, natural, and probable consequence of the act, and the death would not have happened without that act. The natural and probable consequence is one that is a reasonable, that a reasonable person would know is likely to happen. And I'll explain that to you in a moment. More than one cause of death. There may be more than one cause of death. An act causes death only if it's a substantial factor in causing death. A substantial factor is more than trivial or remote. However, it does not need to be the only factor that causes death. And here's why. Because a lot of those questions of the defense, it almost seems to shift blame to the paramedics, law enforcement, were not taking her to the hospital at a certain point in time. When Dr. Lucy said, the last sort of, after he dropped her from the balcony, her liver was lacerated, her kidney was lacerated, she suffered brain damage. Dr. Lucy said, had she been right outside the OR, the operating room, she, he doubts she would have survived with those severe injuries. So his act of strangulation is a contributing factor to Amy's cause of death. Then that's it. He caused the death. Him dropping over the balcony, that's a cause of death. You don't have to question anything about what time did they get to the hospital or, or anywhere else. He's caused her death. He has been a substantial factor in causing her death. Malice of forethought. There are two types. There's express and implied. So all murder starts off of the second degree. Express malice. Express malice just means an intent to kill. And, you know, sometimes defense counsel make it seem like, well, how do you know he, what was in his head? Well, circumstantial evidence. You, Have you ever heard the term, actions speak louder than words? His actions tell you more about his intent than any words that defense counsel are arguing or asking their questions of the witnesses. Lethal dose of nicotine. That does not just happen out of nowhere. That does not land on his lap. He has to go get that. He has to go obtain that. It's a poison that if you inject it into someone, it may not be detected unless they're looking for it. So it's your choice of weapon to kill. This is worse than a gun. You gotta go somewhere to go get this stuff. Her markings on her neck, strangulation. He's actually using his come on. He's using his own hands to snuff the life out of her. That's a lot of anger. That's a lot of hate to do something like that. And he knows it's a three-story balcony. And I do hope she was unconscious. And she did not experience that. But he knows when he's doing that, that he's going to kill her. He's going to finish her off. So that's an intent to kill. You can infer from the facts his intent to kill. There's implied mouth. It's intentionally committing an act. The natural consequence of the act were dangerous to human life. Knew that the act was dangerous. They literally acted with a conscious disregard to human life. Sometimes I I use an example. If someone dislikes 
someone or they know they believe that no one's home and they fire shots into the home but they don't know if anyone's there they're like I'm not intending to kill anyone but I want to send a message to these people that I don't like and they fire a whole bunch of shots into that house well that's an act that's dangerous to human life it's conscious if you got to human life because you should know that someone may be in that house there may be a child there may be someone and even though you're not intending to kill anyone someone could be hurt and killed that's a conscious disregard for human life. That would be an example of implied malice. Not in this case. In this case, for you to find second degree murder under implied malice, you would have to ignore the fact that he brought a lethal dose of nicotine and that he dropped it from the balcony. You would have to ignore those facts. But you're not going to do that. This is not second degree murder, but we'll get to, to first and second. All right, to get to second degree murder, some of you may think, oh, this is intent to kill. He brought the lethal dose of nicotine, he strangled her, he threw her over the balcony. Some of you may say, and I'm not, you're not going to say this. It's not going to be implied malice, because it's not just a conscious disregard for human life. But it doesn't matter which one you think, expressed or implied. As long as you think it's one of those, you're guilty of second degree murder. But this is an intent to kill, when you look at all the facts. When you don't ignore the facts, this is intent to kill, express malice. So once you're an express malice, an intent to kill, because he breaks in, he waits for her. He has a lethal dose of nicotine. He strangles her. He drops her over the balcony. Then you have to ask yourself, is it willful, deliberate, and premeditated? That gets you to first degree murder. Another theory, is lying in wait. And I'll explain that to you. That gets you to first degree murder. murder. So a, either one of these theories proves first degree murder. So let's go through them. Deliberate and premeditated. Willful means intentional. It means it wasn't an accident. Like, I'm not accidentally strangling her. I didn't accidentally have this nicotine on me. I didn't accidentally drop her over the balcony. Deliberate formed by careful thought and weighing of consideration for and against the course of action. We're talking about a 41-year-old man, computer programmer, he knows what he's doing. He planned this. He chose Valentine's Day to do this to her, to end her life. He knows what the consequences are if he does this. He knows. You know, so he's going to go to jail for the rest of his life if he kills her. This is not a child. This is not someone that doesn't understand what the consequences are. Premeditated, considered beforehand. Before he goes over there, he knows what the consequences will be. He knows what he's doing. That's all you need for premeditation deliberation. You're considered before, you know the consequences of your actions, and you still go for it. There's no exact measure of time. His is well planned. It's methodical. This is not like some person sees someone they don't, they don't like, takes out a gun and goes boom, boom, boom. That, that would be an intent to kill, by the way. And that could also be premeditated and deliberate. You have the gun, you aim, you make sure you hit a vital part and you fire multiple shots. That's premeditated and deliberate. So you don't need a long time. As long as you had enough time to think about what you're doing, think about what the consequences are going to be, and you decide, this is not an accident, I'm going to do it. A cold, calculated decision to kill can be reached quickly. The test is the extent of the reflection, not the length of the time. So here, we have a, one of the most, it is so planned out. This, how he has to weaponize himself with that nicotine, how he has to get gloves, how he has to find her house. So he found her phone, and then he had to find where she lived. Then he had to figure out how to get up there. And he got caught off guard. Those ring cameras were installed a week before he did this. And from the video, the way he covers that up, it doesn't look like he was expecting that ring, those ring cameras to be there. Lying in wait. This is another way to get to first degree murder. The defendant murdered by lying in wait if he concealed his purpose from the victim. Amy Amy didn't know what was waiting for her at her home. He waited and watched for an opportunity to act. 
he waited three to four hours for her in that house, in her sanctuary, with that lethal dose of nicotine. Then, from a position of advantage, he intended to and did, did it make a surprise attack on the victim. Absolutely. Can you imagine the moment after Amy texts her friend about sending me the photos at 1.02 a.m.? She still has to get out of her car. She has to unlock that gate. She has to walk to that front door, unlock her front door. She misses that he has broken the French doors. She doesn't think, like no one would think, that there's someone waiting for you, intending to not only cause you harm, but to kill you. Who has, a, he has that poison they're waiting for you. So now she has to walk upstairs. And in that moment, she's carefree. Send me the pictures. We had a great night. She walks up. And it's difficult to say what happened up there on the third floor. She may have placed her bag in the bedroom, dropped her phone on the bed, then walked over to the TV room and in those closets or what have you, in that dark room at that moment. This is her surprise. The ex-boyfriend who's been trying to force himself onto her life. The ex-boyfriend she got a restraining order against 12 years ago. And so that moment must have been horrific. It must have been terrifying. I, in that moment, she knew, based on the email that she wrote, that he intended to cause her harm, she knew what was going to happen in that moment. She knew she was in the fight of her life. A fight that she would not win. So, some of you may think, you know, that's lying in wait. He killed her well and caught her off guard. That's lying in wait murder. That's first degree. Some of you may think, all that planning, all that workup, that's premeditated deliberate. He did both. And it doesn't matter which one you decide got, gets you to first degree. It's first degree murder. Then as to count one murder, if you find that count one murders of the first degree, there's a special circumstance. And the law believes there's certain murders. The way you commit them, there should be more punishment. There's different special circumstances under the law. You kill multiple people, you torture them. There's different types. In this case, it's lying in wait. It it's, has one more element that what gets you to first degree, and I'll show you right now. The defendant intentionally killed the victim, and the defendant committed the murder while lying in wait. What does lying in wait mean for this particular instruction? The defendant concealed his purpose from the victim. That's straightforward. The defendant waited and watched for an opportunity to act. He's waiting in her house. The defendant then made a surprise attack on the victim from a place of advantage. But that just means he's there, she doesn't know he's going to be there, and that's an advantage. And here's the extra element that you didn't have for first degree. The defendant intended to kill the victim by taking the victim by surprise. So when he broke in there and he waited, he intended to kill her. The intent was not just to harm her, not to talk to her, not with that lethal dose, not with him keeping the gloves on the whole time. Not with whatever that rope thing he had around his waistband. Not with him not covering his face and would be identified by Amy Harwick. So this special circumstance is true. So the elements of murder, a human being was killed. Now it's with malice of forethought, that, that gets you to second degree murder. What gets you to first degree murder is if it was willful, deliberate, and premeditated, or if it's lying in wait. And what gets you to the special circumstance is that specific lying in wait instruction. Okay? Right to self defense may not be contrived. The defendant cannot claim, well, when I broke in, uh, all of a sudden she starts attacking me. No. Can you imagine? Like, someone breaks into your home, if someone breaks into your home, you have a right to defend yourself. You have the right uh, to, to beat them. He can't claim, hey, uh, she was attacking me, so I had to defend myself. 
uh, the right to self-defense, uh, the prisoner does not have the right to self-defense if he provokes a fight or a quarrel with the intent to create an excuse for use of force. So, so get that, let's set that straight. Now the defense is asking, or may ask you, may argue to you, voluntary manslaughter. This is not even in the ballpark in this case, and I'll tell you why. That means the defendant was provoked by Amy. As a result, the defendant acted rashly and under the influence of intense emotions, which obscured his reasoning and her judgment. And the provocation would have caused a person of average disposition to act rashly and without due deliberation, that is, from passion rather than judgment. Remember, the key word, a person of average disposition. The instruction actually tells you the defendant is not allowed to set up his own standard of conduct. Well, that's the way I act. I act, I act impulsive and emotional. That's No, that's not the standard. Your very first jury instruction reads, if you look at, at the, towards the bottom of instruction 200, it reads, some of the instructions may not apply depending on your findings about the facts of this case. This instruction given the facts of the case, will not apply for you. <coughs> and here's why. Blocking someone is not reasonable provocation. Do you think that's reasonable provocation? If you block someone, they get to kill you? A person of average disposition would not try to kill Amy because she would not talk to him or because she would defend herself in her home. Objection, Your Honor. So this statement of state of passion will say that a person of average dis disposition would be inclined, inclined to kill um, that is not the standard for hate of passion. Well, that's, that's his interpretation of it, so I'll we'll cover it out. Yes. Uh, and you can read the instruction. And that is, the person of average and I think counsel misread what I wrote up there, uh, the person of average would not try to kill Amy because she would not talk to him. Okay? Or because she would defend herself in her home. That would not happen. Burglary. This is very straightforward. Like the evidence in this case, it is very, very straightforward for you, ladies and gentlemen. The defendant entered an inhabited house, and when the defendant entered the inhabited house, he intended to commit murder. So when he's breaking in, and he has that syringe, and he's gloved up, and he's covering cameras, his intent is to kill her. And the moment he breaks there, and by the way, his intent remains the same throughout his stay in that house, and everything he does there. But the burglary is completed once he's inside. He doesn't have to do anything else. He actually, for burglary, you don't have to commit the crime as long as you enter with that intent. <coughs> Degrees of burglary. Very straightforward. If you, he broke into her house. Breaking into someone's house, that elevates it to first degree burglary. This is not like breaking into a commercial establishment or a store. In a house is where someone lives. So how does the evidence show you his intent to kill? It's not just that moment where he's strangling her. It's not just that moment when he's dropping her over the balcony. His intent to kill, you could get that from all the circumstances in this case, before the murder, during the murder, and after the murder. They all show his intent. So let's talk about before the murder. What's, what's he doing? How's he acting that's telling you that he has an intent to kill? Well, we know they dated for about a year and a half. 2012, she gets a restraining order against him. Stay away. Cuts off all ties with him. She lives on her life. She obtains a doctorate degree. She becomes a therapist. She is cared for and loved by her friends. And then this happens, January 16, 2020. It's just sheer bad luck that she goes, she goes to a conference there on Wednesday, and then by Thursday, she's excited to go to this award show. She doesn't expect him to be there. He doesn't expect her to be there. And for a few seconds before she sees him, everything was okay in the world for her. But then, 
You get these statements. You ruined my life, bitch. You know, the def defense kept examining Hernando about this. He said, I testified. I heard that. I heard the tail end. Yes, they told me that he said that, but I also heard part of it. That's his testimony. By the way, uh, is that something? That, you know, the whole you ruined my life, is that so different than, some, than the horror files and accessing them in 2019? Aspen James has said she was in the middle of a conversation with Amy and the defendant just barged right in between them like she didn't exist because it's all about him. He's the one that feels entitled. I got to get, I got to be heard. That he had an angry tone. That's what she described his tone, angry. He said something to the effect, you fucking ruined my life. Does that sound like love? Or does that sound like anger and hate now? Well, Amy writes an email to herself later that morning. And you'll have it, and you can read it to yourself. And it's coming in for the state of mind. What her state of mind was of fearing the defendant, she would have never consented to him breaking into her home. She would have never consented to him just waiting there for her. Look what she says in her own words, the last paragraph, pa the last paragraph of that email. I'm pretty nervous that I'm more on his radar now. It terrifies me that he's been obsessed for me for nine years, thinks about me every day, can't move on, cries, and throws tantrums in this way. He's focused on harming me. He is focused on harming me. However, I'm hoping that the interaction and the listening and giving him time may cause a neutralization of his anger towards me. Is she describing it as his sadness towards me? No. She's afraid because she could see the anger in him. And she dated him. And she got a restraining order against him. And she describes whatever's happening at that ex phase as tantrums and anger towards her. Not this debilitating depression that the defense argued to you during opening statements. Defendant begins to stop Amy. And I'm not meaning this in the legal word, I'm just in general. He finds her phone on the internet. He will then find her house where she lives. He will then go to her house and break into her house. That's what I mean by that. January 17th, the day after the exodus, I interneted your phone. Her state of mind is she's afraid, and now this defendant, without permission, found her phone on the internet and is texting her. She has not called him since the breakup. Now he's forcing himself into her life. Why does the defense bring up that she may have Googled him in 2019? If, if she got a restraining order against him, and this is someone she's concerned about, uh, why wouldn't she at some point try to figure out where this person is? Doesn't mean she reached out, called them, interacted with them. You have evidence that she didn't interact with them, she never called them. She tells them, basically in that last text message that she sends him, respect me, Let's respect each other and let's move on. So it's almost like she's pleading, please respect that I don't want to be in contact with you. But he doesn't respect her. The next day, she text messages, uh, the same day, she text messages Fernando, Dr. Hernando Chavez, Garrett found my phone number online, messaged me. I told him I didn't want to talk and wish him the best. But his response was still obsessive, scary. Any man comes tomorrow for more locks for my windows and order paper shit. Can you imagine? She has to go through all that. Like, she's living her life, and now she's got to go get a handyman to secure locks. She has to go out of her way to go get pepper spray because she doesn't know what's going to happen to her. And 
in text. Thanks. I set a boundary over text, and I'm not, and I'm not responding after that. He keeps texting me, and it sounds unstable. Defendant does not respect Amy. It's all about his feelings, his emotions. He continues to send manipulative text messages at 2 p.m. at 6.45. You know those text messages where he's groveling or asking her, let's talk, can we talk? That's manipulation. It's a 41-year-old man trying to force his way, in a nice way at first, back into her life. But it's not working. And she's going to cut him off. Amy does not have a duty to give him a hug, doesn't have a duty to respond. She has every right to cut off someone that acts the way he acts. Saturday, January 18, 2020. He leaves a voicemail message. Crying, trying to force himself back into her. This is all manipulation. This is all tantrums. She increases home security, new locks, and brings security cameras. I'm sorry, Nest, Nest security cameras. Sunday, she blocks him. Now you're done. You're cut off. You're not going to have access to me. And that is what triggers a lot of these events when he's completely cut off. He can no longer grovel to her. He can no longer leave voicemail messages to her, leave text messages to her. Texas Grace Stanley. I blocked him through text message, but because of his level of obsession, and I definitely don't think I'm in the clear, I have pepper spray at the house now. My roommate is on alert. I'm up in my home security cameras. Can, can you imagine living like that? Like, you have to do all that just to live? So now the defendant is plotting against her. Now he has no access to her. Finds her phone in January. She's locked. This is premeditated and delivered. When we talk about premeditation and deliberation, he finds her home and obtains a poison to kill Amy. And he selects a poison where he could get away with it, right? He injects her. She may go into seizures. She may vomit. They would have to see the needle mark to even try to test for that poison. And you know, he doesn't smoke. You hear that in the jail conversation when they say, oh, but you don't even smoke. He goes out of his way to get this pure nicotine. And he picks Valentine's Day. Why did he pick Valentine's Day? Well, Valentine's Day is a day where Amy, who's social, who has friends, would probably be out. She's either with a date or she's out with friends, which is what happened. And she is out with friends. And these are the last moments of her life when she was happy. You know, the defense in their opening statement mentioned there's going to be a witness, Elmira Menasaka, who was going to come in and say that he was depressed and all this stuff. You didn't hear any one of it, her or any friend come here and say he was so debilitated and depressed. And, and so what if, if, if he was? Does that mean you get to break in and kill someone? Objection, Your Honor. It's on works for you to which is in the proper argument. Okay. Uh, defendant's actions speak louder than defense counsel's words about what happened in this case. Look what he's doing two hours before he breaks in. He's texting Natasha Paulson. This is two hours before he breaks in. This is all a cover-up. This is like sending messages uh, to different women to show that life is okay. I'm not planning to kill anyone. I'm talking to this woman. I'm talking to that woman. And his text uh, at 7, uh, 10 p.m. Oh, that's totally fine. That's totally fine, busy woman. I'm good. Just also trying to get everything under the sun done with whatever you want to call that emoji, happy face or what have you. That's, that's two hours before he's going to break into her home. 
Also, what does his intent tell you about what happened after he drops over the balcony? Uh, Angeli Judice, like within 10, 11 hours after the murder, he's setting up a date with her. What does that tell you about what he's thinking? And does he care that Amy's dying? No, he doesn't care because it's all about him. Did I get away with it? Did she get what I believe she deserved for blocking me out of her life? That is cold. That is cold-blooded. So, pursuant to his plan, he comes up from the empty lot from behind. And he gets caught off guard by these ring cameras. And he covers them up. Does that sound to you like someone that just wants to talk to someone? Covering up cameras like that. Holding them down, and then they shut down. What's that thing around his waist? That white thing on the outside of the shorts? That looks like rope or something else that you could use to hold her down and inject her with that poison. If you want to talk to someone, well, why don't you just leave a note? I mean, that's kind of, you're going to freak her out. You leave a note, hey, I found your house, can we talk? He didn't do that. He didn't wait outside her home and say, hey, I'm here, which would have been horrible in itself. He didn't do that. He chose to wear gloves, have this rope around his waist, a bag on his hands, cover up cameras. He's not going there to talk. He's on a mission. You have Michael Herman, the roommate. Earlier, before the screen, some, he doesn't know exactly when, but earlier he hears like something like a dish break. Well, that's the defendant breaking into those French doors. He's committed. He's breaking in. I mean, that takes a lot for someone to decide, I'm going to go into someone's home without their permission. I'm just going to break this glass and go inside. And he leaves blood on the French doors and on the floor. That's his DNA. One out of septillion, that's his blood. And he has injuries consistent with kicking in that glass, breaking in there. Scratches. Not only bruises on the knees from landing on his knees when he's fleeing, but he has these fresh scratches. And he's wearing shorts, by the way, when he breaks in. And when he breaks in, when he breaks that threshold of her home, on his person, he has that lethal dose of nicotine. That's when the burglary is completed at that point. Let's talk about this lethal dose of nicotine. So we know the defendant doesn't smoke based on the jail conversation. LAPD criminals could not confirm what that was, right? They couldn't confirm that that was nicotine. Dr. Bradley from the FBI, they were sent to the FBI, they were able to confirm that it was nicotine. Dr. Wu confirmed that it was 86.9% pure nicotine, a poison. Dr. Benowitz testified and said, that would have been a lethal dose had it been injected into Amy Harwick. And difficult to detect. Because as you see, they're not testing for this poison. They're not screening for this poison. Dr. Lucy, the H screen, the homicide screen used by LA, would not have detected nicotine. He would have to have requested it. There's a lot that went into getting, to deciding to get this particular poison. This shows that his intent to kill when he breaks in and when he's, laid in, when he's lying in wait at her home. So while he's inside her home, with that nicotine waiting for her to show up, she's ending her night with her friends. And do you remember Rebecca Jalan Describing how Amy loved tea. And they end their night, and at about 12.30 a.m., 
She's about to leave, and Amy does not know what's in store for her at home. She's being caught off guard and by surprise, which is why that special cert is significant. The way you kill someone, by catching them completely off guard, they don't know what's coming. She gets to her home at about 101, parks her car, texts her friend at about 102, Sarah Rollins, send me the pics on the green couch. Amy will never get to see that picture of her and her friend on the green couch because by the time she, it's sent at 2.05, she's unconscious on the floor, seizing. Here's, here's why this is so quick. Uh, 1.02 a.m. is the text, right? 1.08 a.m., that's when Michael Herman is triggering the neighbor's ring camera. That is six minutes. But that, I mean, it's much shorter than that, the time that the defendant immediately attacked Amy. Because you've got to take into consideration, it's less than six minutes. Amy had to walk upstairs. She had to open the gate, do all that, get upstairs. That takes time. Michael woke up to an ongoing assault. He didn't, like, the assault started when he woke up. The assault woke him up, the, the screams. So it was already going on. It takes Michael time to get from the backyard, go around the house, climb the gate, until he gets to the neighbor's house and triggers it at 108. So the period of time where the defendant's attacking her is immediate. It's in a very, it's less than four minutes. So there's no talking, there's no discussion. It's, she gets surprised by him, she's scared, and he attacks her. Defendant's actions during the murder tell you about his intent to kill also. So we talked about before the murder, now during the murder. Let's see what his actions tell you. Well, he knows he's bigger than her. He didn't show up to someone's house because he thought he could get a challenge. He knew he was bigger and stronger than her, and he was muscular. So at 1.02 a.m., he's up there waiting for her. And he's been there for three to four hours with that lethal dose of nicotine. He doesn't remove the gloves, he keeps them on. And he does not leave. Why didn't he leave? If he just wanted to talk to her and change his mind, why not leave? No, because his intent is to kill. He's angry, he feels rejected. He knew what the plan was. That, that nicotine was for a purpose. He's gloved up so he doesn't leave fingerprints. He catches Amy by surprise immediately. And he wants Amy to know who's killing her. He's not wearing a mask. He's not wearing like a ski mask or anything like that. He knows she's going to be able to see who's killing her. And he wants her to know what happens when you reject him. Michael Herman yells out, leave her alone, motherfucker. And so at that point, the defendant knows either he's going to get caught or someone's going to come up and intervene in his plan. By the way, the term, this is a struggle, this is not a struggle. This is an assault. It's not like two people that can fight each other, that are equally matched. This is someone that's catching the other person off guard. And look at all her wounds, assaultive wounds. She even had defensive wounds. Dr. Lucy said she had bruises on her forearms trying to block blows, consistent with trying to block blows. Amy fought back. She fought to live. She wanted to live. She scratched them. She got his DNA under her fingernails. She knew she was in for the fight of her life, and she was trying. But can you imagine the anger this defendant has as he's punching her, hitting her? You think he's holding back? He's not holding back. Look at those injuries that Dr. Lucy described to her face. Focal injuries. Not injuries that you would get in the face from landing on the pavement. These are smaller focal injuries consistent with getting punched. 
So you have a 230 pound, six foot four guy punching you in the face who's angry. But she's fighting back and she's marking him too. Right? Michael Herman wakes up to blood curling screams. And you know, defense cross examine him. And this is her roommate. He wanted to help as much as he could. He wanted to tell the truth. He's not here to hide evidence. He's not here to make up stuff against anyone. This is a traumatic experience. He didn't know who was up there, or if he ran up there, he didn't know if the individual would have a gun or he would get killed. And if he got killed, then nobody, you would never hear from Michael Herman. You would never hear about him hearing a dish crash beforehand, about her screams, about her body being thrown to the ground. Had he died, you would never hear any of that. He immediately calls 911 and says, my friend is being atta attacked, thrown to the ground. There it is. Why do we have to question, well, you didn't say this on this date, and five days later you said this. People are not machines, they're not recorders, and sometimes witnesses may remember, something may jog their memory and they can remember one more fact. It's up to you to decide, did you make up any facts? On February 17th, he's, he left a voicemail message for the detectives, heard a plate crashing earlier in the evening. This is before any of that LA article that defense counsel questioned him. I mean, that defense counsel questioned Detective Masterson about. You know what's interesting? They didn't ask Michael Herman, hey Michael Herman, let's be fair about this. Here's this LA Times article. Did you ever read that before calling the detectives and telling them on February 20th that she got choked? Did they confront him with that to see what his answer would be? No. They waited to ask Detective Masterson. He would not know how to answer Michael Herman's question. Don't be distracted, ladies and gentlemen. Focus on the evidence in this case. Defendant is wearing gloves. I'm going to take this off. But I, Dr. Lucy said, manual strangulation is a contributing factor to her cause of death. Remember the cause of death? This is a cause of her death. 15 to 20 seconds, you could render someone unconscious. He also said, when, we, when he was asked, well, did he strangle her with two hands or with one hand? He couldn't tell you because that typically you would be able to tell it's two hands because the nails will be embedded into the neck and then you could tell it's two hands. Well, when you're prepared and you're wearing gloves, you're not going to leave those fingernails. Hey, motherfucker, leave her alone. He needs to get out. Defendant needs to leave because he wants to live. He wants to get away with this. He doesn't want to uh, talk. He doesn't want to die. He wants to live. He wants to get away with it. He doesn't want to be identified. He wants the life he's living. So at this point, according to Dr. Lucy, Amy was beaten, and she's fatigued. She's not this, as the defense presented during the opening, this athletic person that all of a sudden the defendant lets her go, and then she on her own decides, the way I'm going to get away from this is I'm going to climb on the outside of the balcony after being strangled. I'm going to have the strength to do that. It's ridiculous. Then they show this photo of her from over a year ago on the balcony where she's posing. Different, completely different situation. It has nothing to do with someone being attacked. It's disrespectful. That photo has nothing to do with this situation. If Amy lives, you know this. You know that if Amy lives, she's seen his face, and this defendant's life is over. She will identify him to the police, and his life is done. He does not want that, and he's going to kill her to make sure that she does not tell anyone what he did to her. And so, her fatigued body, her beaten body, 
is dragged over to the balcony, and there's a blood smear there. And I can't, remember when we told you we can't always pr prove every single thing. That's not the point. Either he got it from his glove, or part of her body, her face that was bleeding, got the blood on there. But you know, in trying to, in trying to drop her over the balcony, he dropped that syringe. So when he's lifting her over the balcony, he knows how high that is. It's 21 feet. He knows what he's doing. He's going to finish her off. She will not be able to identify him. And that's pure concrete down there. Anyone would know. A bit a child would know if I dropped this person, they could die here. But he's not a child. Dr. Lucy, what did Dr. Lucy say? Doubt she would have survived if right outside the OR. Given the liver laceration, the kidney laceration, the brain damage, it wouldn't have mattered. Injuries to the face are focal, meaning she's being punched. Defending pressing on her right shoulder. I don't know if any of you caught this, but there's an injury that where the, it leaves like a white circle here, there's pressing, and there's pressing on the back. She just, so that's the defendant attacking her with his big hand. Manual strangulation, we already talked about that. Gloves prevents from knowing if it's two hands, but that's the point of gloves. The point, the reason he got gloves is to cover up the crime. He doesn't want to leave fingerprints, he doesn't want to leave anything that's related to him. He wants to get away with his murder. You know, then Dr. Lucy is cross-examined by defense counsel, and she's asking him, well, didn't you tell me and this Aaron Mintz something else? And he says, no. And you know what happens after that? There's no Aaron Mintz that comes here and says, he said something else. There's none of that. Dr. Lucy continued with his testimony. He said 50 to 20 seconds would render someone unconscious. Here are the fall injuries. Pelvic fractures. The amount of force when he drops her, it causes those severe pelvic fractures. Those are not caused by kicking someone or any other. That's caused by the impact of being dropped. So she's being dropped on her buttock area. Lacerations to the liver, it's, it's that force of hitting the concrete that sends that shock and lacerates the liver, lacerations to the kidney, the right scapula, there's a fracture on it. It takes a lot of force for that to happen, he said. The right middle of the head, brain damage, a lot of the right side damage, no injuries to the back. She didn't land on her back. She wasn't holding on to some rail and then landed on her back. His opinion, this is a homicide, not an accident. That's his opinion after evaluating her injuries. This is consistent with defendant picking up Amy and dropping her over the balcony and her landing on her buttock area, shattering the pelvis, damaging the liver and the kidney, and then the right side, causing the damage to the right shoulder and the top of the right of the back head. And then she just falls flat after that on her face. Not that she hit the face, because had she hit her face first, there would have been severe fractures, which they were, there were not. The fence during their opening said, what you're going to hear from Bob Malik, who places her on these 3D stills holding on to the railing with one foot on the awning, speculating that whatever damage was in that awning, she caused it. I mean, how, how do you get to that? How do you prove that, that that was not there before this all happened? And how does she do a crunch after being beaten to hold that position? What we do know is uh, our 3D expert created these 3D to help you understand the relationship of all these buildings and location of evidence. And he said he took a measurement from the ground to the floor of the balcony and that's at 17 feet and 7 inches, and that report that he read from Malik was off by almost 3 feet for that distance. 
don't speculate about what Mr. Malik would have testified. Uh, uh, he didn't testify. They didn't call him. They said they were going to call him, but they didn't call him. So don't <laughs> let that distract you from the actual evidence in this case. I'm almost done, ladies and gentlemen. I know you have this look like, <laughs> how much more? There's not that much more, I think. All right. The syringe, he drops it in the balcony. He didn't know he dropped it. Had he known that he dropped that syringe, he would not have left that there. He would have picked that up. In all that commotion and dropping her over the balcony, that fell out of his person. Either he was holding it or it fell out. It doesn't matter. He left that behind. Because now he knows that there's someone, a witness downstairs, Michael Herman, who's yelling. He has to end her life quickly because he has to get out. Because if Michael Herman is yelling, she's yelling, guess who else may hear this? The neighbors may hear this. So what are defendants' actions after he's done this, after he dropped her to her death? Does it show that he's depressed, upset, or does it show, no, he wanted to kill her. That was his whole intent. Well, let's see. The very first thing he does, Amy's there. You saw the body-worn video. How do you leave a human being in that condition and not try to help? How do you not help her? If you loved her at any point, why not help her then? Why not try to call 911 so the ambulance can come? Because it's not love. It's hate and anger now. So he runs through the kitchen door, runs right by her. And I'm going to ask you, look at the photos of her body near the area where he would have to run by. It is so close. It's like right here. And so she, at this point, is in all likelihood unconscious. So much damage to her, to her uh, neck from the strangulation that it's difficult for her to breathe. And he renders no aid. Instead, he thinks about himself. He thinks about his survival. And he just walks by, right, runs right by her, breaks that arm of that statue, jumps over the fence, and leaves her to die. That's more of an intent to kill. He just leaves her to die. And he's still wearing the gloves. Paramedic Turner, who showed up uh, and was one of the first individuals to see her, says, Amy was looking and appearing lifeless. And I cited the page in the transcript. Just want to get my language right on this. Uh, Amy was unconscious. She was not able to breathe on her own. A blood pressure of 60 is not sustainable for life. This is what the defendant did to her. Her condition never improved while while he was there with her. Never improved. So what's the defendant doing after he leaves Amy to die? He texts us. 46 minutes later, he text messages Natasha Paulson. Ha ha, that's funny. I guess he felt he needed to respond to that text message at that point, 46 minutes after dropping Amy to her death. He doesn't care about Amy. He doesn't care about her life. What he's doing, he's covering up his tracks, acting like he was not the guy that was there, like everything's normal for him. Cold blood. A few hours later, he's going to be communicating with his Tinder date that he had from before, Angeli G. Morning, sunshine. This is at 10 a.m., about... 10 hours after he's dropped her from the balcony and seen her body there. What do you think about that? 10 hours after leaving Amy to die, all he's doing is covering up. And she sees the black eye, and he tells her, from what you remember, well, I got that shady. And at 4.30 p.m., they spent all this time together. So, so here he's killed his ex-girlfriend. And he's with this other lady, spending time with her. And then they get, he's going to take her home in his Lexus. 
And then that's when he gets arrested. Because everyone has pointed to the finger to the person that Amy said, if anything happens to me, Gareth Pershoff did it. She knew. They take photographs of his scratches, his bruises. Some of them caused when he tried to flee. Some of them when he broke into her house. And some of them where Amy marked them, where she fought back. At his home, you have these white tennis shoes. You have these shorts with the white stripes that look like the shorts on the camera. You have the gloves that have black at the bottom. Those may or may not be the gloves, but they look like that. Uh, what you also have at his home, they find this syringe with some yellow liquid which is the same brand as the syringe from Amy's balcony. On his phone, it's a computer programmer as we know, there are no text messages. There's no call log. There are no contacts. That's different than the data that you obtained from Amy's, where you had all that information, all the text messages, including his text messages to her. And look at two, two weeks later. I mean, that's his attitude. No, there's no remorse in that conversation. Uh, his intent was always to kill. And in a way, there's he killed the person that was causing him this pain. The person that rejected him. I mean, I saw people that I don't know were saying shit about me in the media and people that I haven't talked to in a long time saying the same thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know her. I've never met her. Yeah. I don't know the I didn't think she knew anything, but she had inserted herself in her fight over. And Amy's name comes up. Is there anything, wow, sorry, life lost, none of that. That's his attitude. Not some depressive state. No remorse. Doesn't care about Amy. So, I already told you the elements of murder. Now you get the second degree. Willful, deliberate, premeditated. Lying in wait. First degree, the special certs. Lying in wait. And we've already discussed how you get to premeditation, deliberation, and the special certs of lying in wait. I'm going to end it with this slide. This is the reasonable doubt. It's the definition of reasonable doubt. I want to start off with what, what it is not. This is my last slide. Uh, it's not beyond all possible doubt, because anyone could play that game. Or is, is this possible? Is that possible? No. It's, beyond, it's not beyond a possible doubt. It is not beyond an imaginary doubt. It's not a, a, a juror saying, well, I can imagine this and that. No. It's 90 percentage. Did the evidence show this by 90 percent, 70 percent? No, it's not a percentage. It's not beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's, that's a movie term. You don't even get that in the law. Uh, it's not based on a hunch. It's not a juror saying, well, you know what? I know the evidence is overwhelming. It shows he did it. It shows he planned it. It shows he had the motive to kill her. But I got a hunch that I missed something. It's not a hunch. It's a juror carefully looking at all the evidence. It is reasonable. That's the key word. It is a reasonable doubt. And the 12 of you get together and you'll know what reasonable is. It's based on the entire consideration and comparison of all the evidence. That means the jury doesn't isolate evidence. Oh, this evidence, there was issues with it. No, it's, <coughs> you look at the entire case. And what does looking at the entire case show you about his guilt? 
It's an abiding conviction of the truth of the charge. What does that mean? That means the jurors here would say, look, if they presented the same evidence that they presented in this trial during the 30 or so days we were here, if they presented it to me a month from now, I vote guilty on first degree murder and the special search. And if they show me the same evidence, 20 years from now, the same evidence, same defense, same arguments from the people and same evidence, 20 years from now, based on the same evidence, I would vote the same way. It's an abiding conviction for the truth of the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Harwick lost her life. She had a life to live. She did all she could. She did everything right. This defendant planned to kill her. We're asking you to hold him accountable based on the evidence in the law. Hold him accountable for first degree murder, find him guilty of that crime, and find the special circumstance of lying in wait when he committed this murder to be true. Hold him accountable for all his actions. Don't minimize what he did. Don't ignore everything he did. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and break for lunch. Let's be back at uh, 1.30. Have a good lunch, if you will.
afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're ready to proceed. Um, this uh, Bernstein Levy, are you prepared to <coughs> go forward? Yes. You may. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to, before I get into everything, I just want to take an opportunity to thank you all sincerely on behalf of the defense team because of the week we were dark with illnesses and you've all been so patient and so attentive and so willing to stick with us. We're all, both sides, extremely appreciative of that, so thank you for that. This case boils down to a very simple question. Why did Gareth Purse House go to 2086 Mount Street on February 14th, 2020? Already technical problem. I have so much I need to say. The answer is clear. He went there because he was desperate to talk to Amy Harwick. Why did he need to speak to her so desperately? Well, you've heard a lot of evidence in this case. Uh, you've had a chance to see Amy Harwick's email to herself describing her encounter with Mr. Pursehouse at the Expos Awards. You've had an opportunity to hear from many witnesses who Amy told about the encounter and included details she hadn't included in her email. You had an opportunity to see Gareth Pursehouse's text messages to Amy Harwick. All of this paints an undeniable picture of the extreme pain Mr. Pursehouse, Gareth Pursehouse, was experiencing after his breakup with Amy Harwick back in 2012. And he struggled in all those intervening years to deal with the daily pain that he described to her in those text messages. It was a struggle he tried to control. He made efforts to get his equilibrium, and he managed to. He dated other women. He was successful in his career. And he had a life, a good life. He had no shortage of uh, romance in his life. But it fell short in his estimation. It was nothing compared to the relationship he had with Amy Harwick. And he described it to her. He said that he shared everything with her during their relationship. And they forged a deep intimacy, one that he couldn't replicate with anybody else. So when Amy Harwick walked into the ex Awards, on that fateful day in January, and he saw her for the first time in all those years after the restraining order had expired years previously. And through no fault of his own, there she was. It landed like a sucker punch on him. And it literally brought him to his knees. He curled up in the fetal position in this crowded red carpet area in front of peers, coworkers, strangers. It was something he could not control. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something we cannot deny. All of the evidence in this case undeniably establishes that Gareth Pursehouse was suffering a great emotional upheaval, one that interfered with his thought process, one that focused him like a laser on getting relief from this unrelenting pain. And the only person he thought could help him, that could release him, was Amy Harwick. And why is that? Because when he saw her, and she spoke to him, it was cathartic. 
he was able to let that facade open. He, the emotions he'd repressed for so long surfaced, and he cried, and he cried some more. He was shaking. I mean, the, the descriptions that we've gotten from Amy Harwick and her friends establish a man in a crisis. The prosecution claims he was trying to force his way back into her life, but that couldn't be further from the truth. He was trying to cope with the fallout of Amy Harwick walking back into his life. He didn't ask for that. It was a chance encounter. And it left him reeling without a lifeline. The evidence in this case shows both an internal dialogue Mr. Pursehouse was going through as well as how he externally presented to other people as a result of the manifestation of his emotional crisis. So I'm going to want to go through some of the evidence in this case that, that shows the state of mind Mr. Pursehouse was in. But before we get to that, I want to talk about this jury instruction. This is CalCrim 303, and this is very important because you've received a lot of state of mind evidence in this case. And it's very important you understand the limitations to the state of mind of Amy Harwick because that evidence is only admitted for a limited purpose. So let me be clear on what that purpose is by first going through the instruction with you. During the trial, evidence of Amy Harwick's email to herself and statements to friends related to her fear of the defendant Gareth Pursehouse are being admitted for a limited purpose to show her then state of mind that she was in fear of the defendant that she would not have consented to him entering her home and would not have consented to him lying in wait. You may not consider this evidence for, you, you may consider th that evidence only for that purpose and for no other. So you cannot use this evidence in any way to decide whether or not Gareth Pursehouse intended her harm. All of her statements about her fear, how he might, in her mind, have intended her harm, those are not something you can consider in assessing Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind or his intentions. That being said, let's move on to Amy Harwick's email to herself. It might be a little hard to read, but I'm going to highlight certain parts of this. She describes, you know, the first encounter, how Gareth came up behind her and started screaming. And then she describes how he started looking like he was going to cry. And he was breathing heavily and flailing his arms around. And she also makes a point of, um, well, yeah, that he's dysregulated in his eyes. That part is not highlighted. So she's describing a person whose emotions are taking over their physical body. He was sobbing. His head, his head was in his hands. He couldn't sit up straight. His head was in his hands. He was hyperventilating. He was distorting his face up and shaking violently. He was tr shaking so hard he couldn't control it because of his emotions. He told me that he thinks about me every day, and every day he cries. He told me he lost his job when we broke up because he couldn't work. He told me that no matter what, no matter what he did, he couldn't stop obsessing over me. He told me that I was a cheater and a liar because he thought we were still together when I believed we were broken up. So, Mr. Pursehouse also felt there had been, um, you know, that Amy had cheated on him during the course of their relationship. Um, and that was, you know, back when they were together. And he recited text messages that she had sent from that time frame, back when they were together, about nine years ago. He recited the date, who they were to, and exactly what was said word for word. 
He said he wasn't able to move on. But he's dated, but nobody with me. He said he thinks about me constantly, and he can't watch the TV shows that we watch together, hear the songs that we liked, or the names that we called each other, or even smell vanilla, or he has a panic attack. And all of that was before Amy Harwick walked back in in his life. He's describing what his day-to-day life was like before that encounter at the Ex-Biz Awards. Imagine what it must be like to go through your day-to-day activities carrying the burden of those emotions. Imagine how exhausting that must have been. Imagine how hard Mr. Pursehouse would have had to work to maintain the life he, he established, working as a programmer, uh, having a savings of over $100,000, and trying to have a normal life, despite the heavy burden he was carrying day in and day out. Amy goes on to say, I actually did tell him I was sorry. Sorry that things ended so terribly. Sorry that I had to take the measure of getting the restraining order because I just didn't see any other option. She, she acknowledges their relationship ended terribly. It ended with a restraining order, meaning Mr. Pursehouse couldn't contact her, and he didn't for all those years after it even expired. After this conversation, he went back to take pictures, but he asked if they could speak later, and she told him yes. And you'll remember Hernando Chavez described the second, when Mr. Pursehouse approached Amy while they were seated at their table inside the ex Awards award ceremony. And he described how Mr. Pursehouse came over, knelt down next to Amy, and whispered in her ear, And then Amy turned to Hernando Chavez and said, I'm going to go talk to Gareth some more. So Amy goes on to explain that towards the end of the award show, I sat with him off to the side again as he cried and shook. He was still crying later in the evening. He was still that emotionally devastated that he still was not able to control his crying and his shaking. He, did, he was able to sit up straight and have more of a conversation, and they were able to clarify some things. But he couldn't stop crying, couldn't stop hyperventilating. And he'd have a moment of clarity and then just start breaking down. He said he wakes up every day and cries on the floor. He says every day he wished, he wished I was in his life every day for all those years. And then she goes on to conclude, at the end of this conversation, I told him my friend Hernando was waiting for me and I asked how he would like to end this conversation. He asked for a hug and I told him that was not a good idea and he started to cry. Eventually, he walked away and then she makes a note of him walking away properly and something about putting his hand up as he walked away. These these excerpts and Amy Harwick's email to herself have important information in them. In In these clips we hear about Mr. Pursehouse's regrets, his regrets about his relationship with Amy. But, but he did not have an opportunity to fully articulate himself that day. Why? Because he was in a very emotionally disturbed state. He was shaking, he was crying. I'm going to object as to this is being admitted for other than a limited purpose of the victim's state of mind. Sister. Without having an opportunity to fully express himself, Mr. Pursehouse reached out 
to Amy Harwick by text message. Oh, before we get to that, let's talk about Amy Harwick's description of Gareth to her friends. The prosecution made a point in their opening argument earlier today of saying this was a tantrum. But Marcy Mendoza made a point to say, no, that's not what Amy said, not a tantrum. She said he went crazy, he was erratic, he broke down. And Sarah Rowland said, Amy said he went a little crazy, he was triggered, he got into the fetal position on the ground, he was crying and reciting text messages. Now we can go on to Gareth's messages to Amy Harwick, which are very hard to see. So he starts, I internetted your number. Recognize it now that I see it, if I'm allowed to text. And then there's a series of the letter P, and Mr. Pershouse tries to use humor, because this is an awkward, emotional situation. Yes, we shall all pee. And she responds, oh wow, my text was left open and I'm on a call, sorry. And smile my face. He says, so you're not really into talking about P now. She says, I'm glad we had a chance to speak last night. It sounds like we both needed to express and hear some things from the other, other person. And he continues to joke, just sometimes P, got it. I'm sometimes Y. And then referring to her text, yeah, I will do. I slept well almost an hour at 7 a.m. So he had a sleepless night. And I'm right now listening to a phone conference literally about organizing psych articles for the rapists. Now, we're going to get to know Mr. Pursehouse's sense of humor. He likes to play wordplay. And if you put the word the rapists together into one word, it's the word therapists. I'm going to object as soon as I sign evidence. That's your take on it. Doesn't mean that it means that, but it, it's correct that it means that if you put it together. But go ahead. Thank you. She says, "I think it was really good that we were able." Oh, wait. Let's see. He says, "Not sure if you're done because you. Not sure if you're done because you said, how do we finish this now? Last night, but if we can meet again." And she says, I think it was really good that we were able to speak last night. I'm sure there's a lot more that you want to process and say to me. So she acknowledges, she realizes, yes, he didn't have a full opportunity to process everything, you know, being so caught off guard that way. And that there were still things he wanted to say to her. But for Amy, that, that's not what she needed. And that's fine. And there's no blame to Amy for her choice or her setting of boundaries no one can test that was within her right and that was an appropriate thing for her to do. She says, I think that was a lot for both of us. I hope you were able to hear that, hear me last night when I said that I was sorry for anything that caused you suffering and that I forgive you for the things that you did to me. I think right now it's best to have some space and I don't mean that in a negative way. The past is sad and triggering for both of us. I think we ended our talk last night well. We can be civil from a distance, respect each other, and move forward with our own lives. And Mr. Pursehouse responds, so you're still just gone, which is exactly my nightmare, and sadly what I expected. So you're still just gone, which is, I'm sorry, and it feels the same as when I wrote you that long list of what I would miss about you and heard nothing back, just reaching out into the darkness, trying to stop falling. I wish I could do something more, but reaching out to you is a crippling action that I had actually contemplated several times over the past few months just to say to you the word, help. Admitting to you how hurt I am is so embarrassing and painful, which demolishes me even more 
because it used to be. I told you every detail about myself, no matter what. So what he is saying here is that he needs help. He knew it before he saw her. He even thought about reaching out to her before he saw her, but he restrained himself. He did not. And he knows that this isn't right, that he shouldn't be in this emotional state. That's why he needs help. And that's why he's embarrassed that it's so painful, that he can't get past this. And it demolishes him to have to acknowledge this to her. He's not manipulating her. He's revealing his darkest secret to her. I don't know how busy you are, he says, and it truly scares me so much more than I can possibly convey to say this. But please don't vanish on me. Please, please don't let me go through that again. He's begging her, please don't vanish. He's begging her for a chance to talk to her. And when she doesn't respond, he leaves the voicemail message that we heard at the beginning of my statement. Gareth was consumed by emotions and in a crisis. All of these emotions that we've described are the exact hallmark types of emotions that prevent a person from deliberating. When you look at the definition and the elements of first degree murder. These are the terms Amy and her friends used to describe Gareth. Dysregulated, out of control, crying, breathing heavily, hyperventilating, shaking violently, obsessing, panic attacks, couldn't stop crying. I mean, everything that you go through, this shows a man in, a, in an emotional crisis. And then his own words. This is my nightmare. I'm reaching out into the darkness, trying to stop falling. Reaching out is a crippling action. Help. He's embarrassed. It's painful. He's demolished. And he's afraid. The intensity of his feelings frightened him. So of course they frightened Amy Harwick. Of course. Please don't let me go through that again. Don't just vanish. Please call me. Now, the prosecution wants to trivialize all of this. They want to pick it apart and take it out of context in a way to prevent you from using it as it's intended to be used to show Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind, to show why he went to 2086 Mound, and to show that he was not thinking clearly. He was in a genuine emotional crisis. Now those text messages that we looked at, I want to remind you that those text messages did not become available until late 2021. This case was filed in February of 2020. Gareth Purcell's phone was immediately taken to that Orange County Regional Computer Forensic Lab to be examined. Amy Harwicks was not. It was simply brought to the LAPD. They couldn't open it because it was pass protected. And then, for some reason, the LAPD didn't even bother to go into that phone until after the preliminary hearing in late 2021. So when these charges were filed, when we had the preliminary hearing, we did not have the benefit of Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind I'm evidence. Object. I'm evidence what they had in Well, the timeline speaks for itself, ladies and gentlemen. The prosecution is claiming that Gareth 
was trying to, I can't remember exactly the word they used, but something to cover up his crime by engaging with Natasha Paulson and Angeli G. But what they don't tell you, and what is obvious if you've paid attention to the evidence, is that Gareth Pursehouse was trying to resume his equilibrium when he reached out to Natasha Paulson and Angela G and was trying to have relationships with them. He was trying to resume his normal life, but it was obvious he couldn't because he showed up at her house still suffering under the emotions that he had described to her that he had been suffering since they broke up. So after seeing Amy, Gareth tried to recover his fragile equilibrium, but he was consumed, consumed by his emotions. This was not an attempt for him to cover up a crime. How would that cover up a crime? Texting with somebody over, there's a huge gap in the text between Natasha Paulson and Gareth Pursehouse. It doesn't even look like an attempt to try to show he was engaged in, in anything other than being at her home with that time gap. There's no attempt to cover up where he was in those text messages. And reaching out to Angela G, Angela G on the day, February 15th, the day he ultimately was arrested, there's nothing unusual about that. He was sad, she said. She said she wanted to comfort him the way he comforted her when she was sad. And he suggested they go to a firing range, something they had never done. He knew she was somebody who was into guns, but for some reason on that day, he suggested they go to the firing range. The prosecution also claims that Gareth Pursehouse was reacting out of anger when he arrived at 2086 Mound, that he had this whole thing planned out that he went there with the intention to kill Amy Harwick, that he went there with the intention to murder her. But where is the anger in those, in those messages? He's supplicant towards her. He's asking, if I may, he's not aggressive with her. He's not saying he's entitled to anything. He's just telling her how vulnerable he is and how need, needy he is. Something that's difficult for him to do, but he did it. If he was angry at her for being blocked, his text messages being blocked, then why wouldn't that anger have surfaced all those years ago when she got a restraining order against him? I'm going to object based on the court's ruling as soon as I saw an evidence. Uh, oh, oh. If he was so angry at her, wouldn't his anger have surfaced at the time when it was close to their breakup? Why wait all of these years if, that, if anger were his motivation? That doesn't make sense. And anger was not his motivation. If it had been, it would have surfaced before February 14th, 2020. The only anger he showed her at the Exfiz Awards was anger about his perce perception of her hypocrisy. You'll remember that... Um, there was discussion about why are you here? He kept asking her, why are you here? And Ashley Jameson, or Aspen Jameson, asked, or said, you know, from her it seemed that there had been an issue about him, about her, about Amy Harwick, disapproving of the porn industry. And Gareth was making an issue of that when he was asking her why she's here, because during their relationship, it had become an issue. He was... It was shocking to him to see Amy there, knowing that she had disapproved of the industry. The Amy he knew I'm gonna disapproved. Say not an evidence. It, it, it does, counsel. Uh, so you can rephrase your, your statement or move on. Thank you. Aspen Jamison said it seemed as though she disapproved of the porn industry. So. Gareth Pursehouse's anger towards her about hypocrisy was directed towards that. Why would somebody who disapproved of the industry be at an industry event? 
This was the last place in the world he expected to see her. And that led to him being completely floored, literally floored, when he saw her there. Prosecution has introduced statements that Gareth Pursehouse made to his friends while he was in custody at one of the jail facilities. And I want to go through that with you. First, you know, there's, there's a jury instruction that tells you how to evaluate a defendant's statements. And it says it's up to you to decide how much importance to give the statements. And the prosecution is trying to claim that this these statements to his friends are somehow an admission of guilt. So I want to put them in context so that you can make the determination of how much importance to give these statements. Let's see if this will work. Oh, dear, man. How are you? <laughs> Shitty. Uh, hey, uh, can you help my brother pack up my house, please? Yeah, that's one of the things we we're going to try to talk to you about and see what we can do to help on the, on the outside. Yeah, please, please do that. And, I mean, that's essentially it. How, how do we know how to get... So the first thing he says to his friends is, can you help my brother? My brother's going to need a lot of help. Can you help him pack up my house? How are you, man? How are you? <clears throat> I'm not getting out of here. Uh, I have court tomorrow, for, but just to like postpone my initial trial. Mm-hmm. And uh, and my brother's gonna need a lot of help to get my stuff out. I got out of I got out on bail for a minute, but then I got brought back right, right back in. So they took every penny I had in savings. So now i I have zero cents and actually put my brother in debt a little bit. So that's really fucked up. And. Uh, I need Dave to give him the money he owes me. I think badly. Busy this week. Okay, well, at some point, I need Dave to pay my brother the money he owes me because it won't. It, I can't. I, you know, I'm not working anymore. Um, and uh, I mean, that's essentially that's essentially it, really. I hear I hear there's a lot of news. Yeah, you were all over the news, pal. But. Yeah. All over. Is that your hair? I think I see your head. Yeah. Fuck it. Ugh, they put me on the wrong thing, so I'm like leaning over. I can't. I can't reach up. <laughs> I saw your arm. Yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, so my brother's gonna need a lot of help, like just packing up all my house and uh, and moving into his house in San Diego. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, do you remember what's the number? Do you have it? And throughout the conversation with his friends, and a lot of this was bleeped out so that the number would not become public, but there's continual conversation about repeating the number so that Gareth knew his friends would be able to remember his brother's phone number and reach out and help his brother. I saw. <laughs> Did you really? Did you really? No, no, no I'm kidding. I'm no, you sound like Dave. It's a Dave thing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in total isolation. So, like, I'm in a cell alone all the time. Oh, shit. It's super fun. And, uh, um, yeah, so. So, now uh, that's a, why you had the public defender, huh? You, you spent all that money to get the bail out for one day. Yeah, for like 15 hours. 15 hours. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so obviously my work fired me, or there, there probably are, I assume, I don't know, I, I assume they are. And, uh, yeah, and my, my brother had to do all of this for our dad dying last summer, and now he has to do it all for me. So this is a lot to, for to deal with, so any help you guys can do, yeah. super please. Yeah, we can do for sure. So we're learning about Gareth's current predicament, that he's in isolation, that other than his brother, this is the first time he's had anybody else to talk to, he's in isolation, uh, that he lost a lot of money. Uh, yeah, so I'm just really worried about my brother, and I'm hoping that the bail bondsman will return the money to him so they can have 
money. You know, it's 130 grand. Every single cent I had plus some. So I'm hoping I get, they'll get that back. He said he would, but I don't know. How are they going to get it back? That's a third party thing. I remember I was never able to get my back. Yeah, the, the guy's saying he might keep the guy's saying he'll give it back, but I don't believe him. So right now I'm just hoping. You know, I don't know. If you, if you can help him find a legal way to do it, because the guy, basically I was out, right? And then uh, I hadn't paid him yet. And then the guy found out they were going to bring me back into, into court or back into jail. And so he rushed me to the, he turned off all, he took us to turn off all our phones saying the media was tracking us and then took me to the bank and got, got me to give him the money. And then he dumped me at a in and out and said he was going to be back. And then the uh, task force arrested me again. What? I'm sorry. So, yeah. So if it turns out that they, he doesn't give me the money back, my brother the money back rather, if you can try and help with the legal part of trying to do that, possibly if that happens. I, you know, anything, please. Um, and yeah, so I'm really needy right now. I just need help <laughs> with all these outside stuff, which sucks. Yeah, we'll, we'll contact your uh, your brother and see what we can do to help for sure. Man. Thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, I was really. Is there, can we like give you money for like your uh, whatever? No, I don't. I don't want any of that. Thank you, though. I don't. I don't care about that shit. All I, all I care about is, is my, is my, you know, I help my brother. And if my brother gets the money back, then he could just use, like, it's plenty. <laughs> he could just use that. But, you know, I don't know. But I don't want to be, like, used to using the store kind of a thing here. I don't care. So as you can see, Gareth's primary concern at this point is his helping his brother clean up his mess, the mess that he's created. No, no I was, I was uh, hit up a bunch of times already. Trying, people were trying to <laughs> sell uh, pictures, and, yeah, daily mail, whatever. It was like, the restraining order just ended fucking two days ago, and they were like, you could, no, like, that's a lie, it ended like 15 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> No, we didn't know that they, the truth came out. I mean, oh, okay, got it. They put Amy on a, a 48 hour CBS, you know, that 48 hours. Oh, yeah, they called my brother. They wanted me to be on it when I was out. They called us when we were out. Um, yeah, uh, anything, anything, like, yeah, so like you said, they're trying to sell, buy things, whatever. If, if something like big ticket money wise comes in, then fucking sell it. Just give the money to my brother. Because he's gonna be, he's dealing with so much. Like I don't care. There's no, there's no. It doesn't matter, you know. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Tr just yeah. That, I mean, that's essentially it. Help, help, please help my brother. And uh, hopefully, he goes on. Yeah, everything comes down to just helping, helping my brother pack up my my world, and and um, get it to his place. Yeah, get to San Diego, and hopefully, and he's trying to buy a house right now, so I'm hoping he can get that money back and he can use that to buy a house. And then if I get out, I can have a room. As <laughs> we have a bigger house. And then um, here's one of uh, Gareth's jokes and some other interesting information. But that would be good for my brother. Uh, but I, I do have a joke for you. Uh, what's, what's the most feminine candy bar? Huh. Hershey's. <laughs> oh, you see, I'm just, I'm, yeah, you got your sense of humor. You're making the best of it. Now. Hey, yeah. you get to give you a pen and paper to actually like write stuff no, down there? Inside? Not yet. I'm trying to get a pencil. I have a piece of paper, but I haven't got a pencil yet. Uh, what is it? He's in a position where he has absolute no autonomy, can't even get a pencil, completely relying on people to help him in the most basic ways. And, as, and let me make a comment about the use of humor. 
Hugo, uh, Hernando Chavez made a comment during his testimony about using humor as a defense mechanism. He explained to all of us that even though he was in shock and grieving while he met with police officers after Amy Harwood's death, he still interacted with people, still worked, and still saw clients. And then he explained that humor is a defense mechanism. People will cope with grief and loss and shock in different ways. He said he could feel deep shock and sadness and also be able to do all the things he described. So the use of humor as a defense mechanism does not mean someone is cold and callous. Moving on. that he says he doesn't want to have hope. He's just trying to make it day by day. This is the last clip. Okay, you can like, see it on your door. And, uh, um, oh, when I was first brought in here, they had me on, like, suicide watch, so I was, I was sleeping. I had, like, a tarp, like a poncho made out of tarp, like plastic tarp as clothing. That was my clothing instead of real clothes. So now I'm wearing normal clothes now, but yeah, before it was a nightmare. For like a week, I was wearing a tarp. <laughs> not, most, not the most comfortable thing. Uh, I so now we know that he's also been on suicide watch during his incarceration. So we established during testimony that this, this tape was made about 16, 17 days after Mr. Pursehouse's arrest. 16, 17 days of being in isolation for his chance to be able to speak to some other people. Now, the prosecution has offered some unreliable evidence to you to support their theory that Mr. Pursehouse had always intended to kill Amy Harwick. The prosecution during their opening argument specifically talked to you about Hernando Chavez and his comments about what he heard at the Ex-Biz Awards and Aspen Jamison's comments and compared the two. And as you recall, Aspen Jamison said she heard Mr. Pursehouse say, funny seeing you here when he first came up. And something along the lines of, you fucking ruined my life. Now, the use of the word fucking is something, as you can hear from these clips, is something Mr. Pursehouse says. But that doesn't mean he uses it in a way that's hostile or angry. But when, you, when Mr. Chavez indicated that he heard the statement, there's an embellishment. He claims to have heard, when he testified, he claimed to have heard Gareth Pursehouse call Amy Harwick a bitch. Now, when confronted about that, with that, sta about that statement on cross-examination, Hernando Chavez admitted that previously, on February 18th, 2020, when he was interviewed by detectives about what he observed at the Ex-Biz Awards, he told detectives he did not hear Gareth call Amy a bitch. But suddenly, when it comes time to present testimony, it's a new recollection that he has. And these new recollections need to be looked at carefully. 
because there are a way the prosecution can try to put their thumb on the scale by embellishing the facts. And we need to have a fair trial here. And that means the evidence offered by the prosecution needs to be examined critically. You can't just accept something someone says because they're saying it under oath. But you have to examine all the circumstances and whether they've made prior inconsistent statements and evaluating the veracity of their testimony. Hernando Chavez was one of Amy Horwick's closest friends. And it, I can't fault him for wanting to remember things in a way that helps prosecute the person that he thinks is responsible for her death. I don't think he's a bad person for that. But that doesn't mean we don't critically examine his testimony. So I ask you to disregard that statement because Gareth Pursehouse did not call Amy Horwick. Harwick that word. And we have corroboration of that because Amy, Gareth Pursehouse did not call Amy Harwick that word and Amy Harwick did not note it in her email to herself. If he had said that, you would think no, Amy Harwick right. would have written it in her email to herself. I'm asking to consider that other than the state of mind exception. Right, to stay. Another reason to doubt Mr. Chavez's testimony is his recollection of the second conversation <coughs> that occurred at the ex -Biz Awards. You'll recall when he testified, he told us that he remembered after Amy and Gareth walked away from their table in the award ceremony, he went out and sat on a chair and watched the entire conversation. But the text messages between he and Amy Harwick show that is not what happened. This is defense C. During that second conversation, Amy Harwick texts, texts Hernando Chavez and says, I'm around to the right talking, I'm okay. And he sends the hand emojis. And then follows up at 11.39, about 15 minutes later, still talking. If you were sitting there watching them, he wouldn't have to ask. And she says yes. And he responds, okay, I'll be floating around. I'll walk you to your car. So he's off floating around while Amy and Gareth are talking. And then he says, let me know when you're ready. And she says, okay, just a few men. Almost done. And then he asks where she is. Are you downstairs or upstairs? Where should I head towards? And then she tells him where to find her. And that's because he was not sitting there watching. His recollection cannot be trusted. Prosecution has also asked you to believe that Amy Harwick could not have fallen over the balcony railing of her own volition because they want you to believe she was strangled to unconsciousness. However, the evidence does not support that interpretation of, the, of what happened. Dr. Luzzi testified what he would expect to happen if someone was strangled to unconsciousness and he made a point of saying he would expect he would suspect that she would lose control of her bowel and bladder. There was no losing control of bowels in this case. There is a, a suspicion that there was urine there. We don't know who that urine belonged to, if it belonged to a person or her cat. But without the bowel movement, we cannot say Amy Harwick was strangled to unconsciousness. 
And someone can urinate themselves just by being startled and screaming the way Amy Harwick was described to be screaming by Michael Herman. Dr. Luzzi said it takes 15 to 20 seconds for someone to lose consciousness if they're strangled. Michael Herman says he was downstairs listening to what happened. And during the trial, for the first time, Michael Herman testified that it became eerily silent after he heard choking sounds. All of Michael Herman's prior statements indicated all he heard was Amy Harwick constantly screaming, that there were no moments of quiet. But by trial, his testimony changed, and suddenly there was an eerie silence, which we're supposed to assume meant she was unconscious. But ladies and gentlemen, that is not what happened. Amy Harwick was conscious and screaming the entire time. I want to go through some of the um, prior inconsistent statements of Michael Herman with you. This is from Exhibit 28. At 1.25 a.m., Michael Herman's initial encounter with the first responders, Officer Fisick and his partner, Eddie. later. What was 
was she screaming? Did you just, just yelling? She, just yelling. And then the officer, you, the officers found her out here. Yes, like this. Yeah. Her back, like, to get back in. Like, she was laying there. I couldn't. I mean, at first, I thought it was a doll. I was like, "You got to be fucking kidding me!" Like. And then at 2.09 a.m. She was yelling from the whole time. I was looking for a weapon. I'm trying to find the phone. Yeah. Then I, that's like I got shut. Hey, you know, yelling. And then I'm in here looking for all this stuff. Then I run out the back door. And they're still screaming the whole time. I'm telling you, it sounded like a struggle. Like, yeah. I just didn't know how many. I, didn't, like, I just didn't want to just take them here. But, you know. <laughs> At 2.09 a.m. She was still upstairs yelling when I ran out. Right. right. And at 7.54 a.m. All right, she was still yelling when I left. Okay, she was yelling the whole time. I'm telling you, that's why I knew, that's why I knew. I knew that there was somebody else in here. Okay, now this is kind of, kind of strange, but can you yell? Like she, like, how, how, what did it sound like to you? <laughs> Sounds of screams, no choking, no moments of silence. She was screaming the whole time. And then at 9.41 a.m. at the LAPD station. Oh, no, before that, 7.55 a.m., I'm sorry. Where, how far are you in the camp here? I don't know. I just heard the one that still left the door. I mean, that's the door. It was like, just it happened, like, coming out. I still hear it. You still hear the screams. And when you're... And when you're and then at the station at 9.41 a.m. Oops. And can you, re can you remember? Do you still hear screaming? I still heard screaming. When I was still hear screaming. Yeah, and we were at the house. You know, when I was yelling, because when I was leaving, I yelled up there, hey, motherfucker, like really loud, because I wanted her to think I was going upstairs, so right. maybe he'd like stop and run. You know, that you know that he's not in the house alone or two of them. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And I didn't know it was like, you know, I didn't know there was multiple people. I, you know, I just didn't right. know. And, and um, I just hoped that that would, like, that they would make the person flee. Right. And, and besides, the, <clears throat> besides hearing her screaming, what else did you hear? That's all I remember hearing. Well, didn't you, you mentioned to me that you heard, like, oh, well, yeah, this shuffling, shuffling, yeah, 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 from I mean, another fucking person, yeah, 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 it sounded like, that, didn't, that's, that wasn't when I was, like, running out, that was when I was yelling at Amy, that was when, like, you know, it felt like I heard, like, shuffling, okay, did you hear, because when I ran out, like, I just yelled, hey, motherfucker, and then I ran out, like, so you like, see like, Amy, and you hear the shuffling, yeah, yeah, and then you go into the room, you come back out of the room, she's still screaming, yeah, <clears throat> And then you yell back up again, and then you exit through the back door. Yeah. Besides the shuffling, her screaming, do you remember? Did you hear anything else like banging or clanking or no, no, things all right. falling down? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so detectives ask him point blank, what else did you hear? And there's still no mention of choking or moments where she stopped screaming. It's consistent. It's consistent with her being conscious and screaming the, all, the entire time that he was able to hear things. There was no moments of eerie silence. Amy, Amy Harwick was not strangled to unconsciousness. Another issue that has arisen is during the autopsy, uh, Dr. Luzzi wrote a report documenting the injuries that he found on Amy Harwick. But for the first time during his testimony at trial, he mentioned a new injury. He testified to nasal fractures, something that he did not include in his report. And he admitted that 
when he testified. He did not include evidence of nasal, nasal fractures in his report. And he indicated in his testimony that what he was relying on to conclude that she had received nasal fractures, nasal fractures that he said were consistent with being punched in the face. He relied on a PowerPoint provided to him by the prosecutors. He did not know, Dr. Luzzi did not know where the images on the PowerPoint came from, and he didn't know if the images were even from this autopsy. Dr. Luzzi admitted he made no findings of nasal fractions, fractures in the autopsy report. So based on questionable evidence, suddenly at the trial, the prosecution tries to introduce evidence of a punch in the face. Now I know when Mr. Avila was going through his opening arguments to you, he didn't mention it. And I don't know if that means they realize something's wrong with that evidence, but I'm gonna the prosecution. I'm going to ask the jury to speculate about what's, what the prosecutors are thinking. All right, the same. The prosecution will get another opportunity to argue to you, and I will not. This is my only opportunity to speak to you, so I do have to anticipate, try to anticipate what I think they may argue. And they may argue in their rebuttal argument these nasal fracture, fractures, which are completely unreliable evidence in this case and should not be believed by you. The reason the prosecution wants this evidence before you is because they're trying to paint an inaccurate picture of what happened. They're trying to convince you that Amy Harwick was in a debilitated state because she'd been punched in the face and strangled to unconsciousness. Therefore, she could not have gone over that railing of her own volition. But the prosecution's evidence is not convincing. It is not reliable. It is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution has not proven to you that Amy, Amy Harwick was incapable of climbing over that railing in an effort to escape. Michael Herman testified that he had sciatica, and that was why he didn't run upstairs to help Amy. He was afraid he wasn't in physical condition to be able to be in a fight. But even with his impaired state, he was able to climb a much higher gate, not once, but twice. Exactly the adrenaline, the exact same type of adrenaline that Michael Herman had coursing through his body that got him over that fence, not once, that spiked fence, not once but twice, was the same type of adrenaline Amy Harwick had at her disposal. And it makes sense that if you see somebody you're afraid of, you're going to run for the exit. And Amy Harwick was comfortable being on the railing of that balcony and she had the means and the ability to climb over it. And the prosecution has not proven otherwise. Now the prosecution has brought up the fact that we did not call Bob Malik to testify about the reconstruction. And that really tells me that the prosecution is worried about their case because they know it is their burden of proof. They are the ones who have to present evidence to you, not the defense. We get to rely on the state of the evidence. We get to rely on the prosecution's failure to prove their case to you. And they are the ones who should have hired an accident reconstruction expert to present to you definitively how they feel their interpretation of the evidence in this case is merited by the dynamics of falls and how you calculate falls and accident reconstruction. You saw the prosecution spared no expense in this case. They've brought experts in from all over, experts who are very learned, experts who charge a lot of money. They paid over $65,000 to get a 3D sanitized, I call it, sanitized recreation of 2086 mound and 2080 mound, but they did not present you with evidence to tell you how Amy Harwick came to land in the position she was in at the bottom of that balcony. 
That's on the prosecution. It's their burden to prove it to you, and they have failed to do that. I just I forgot to also mention one other fallacy, a couple other fallacies about the autopsy and the signs of the beating to the face. If Amy Harwick had been punched in the face and received those nasal fractures, there would have been blood. And there is no blood on the balcony, in the bedroom, in the hallway between the blue room and Amy Harwick's bedroom, anywhere, to substantiate a claim that she was punched in the face with such force that she was caused nasal fractures and she was debilitated. All of the blood was where she came to land, which is consistent with injuries from a fall. Also, you saw photographs of Gareth Purcell's hands. Now, the prosecution made a point of telling you that there are no cuts on Gareth Purcell's hands because he was wearing gloves. Now, I dispute and I disagree that they have proven he was wearing gloves inside the house, and we'll talk more about that later. But primarily what I want you to focus on is the fact that his hands were not bruised. If he is punching somebody with such force to cause nasal fractures, you would see bruising to his hands. And there was no bruising to substantiate that type of assaultive injuries. Gloves would not protect you from those types of bruises. Gloves would not protect your hands from showing signs of hitting somebody with enough force to break their nasal cavity. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it was Amy Harwick who left her DNA on the balcony door. I'm showing you People's Exhibit 93. You'll remember uh, Nick Sanchez, I believe, was the uh, witness who testified about collecting a swab, collecting uh, biological evidence from this area. And we asked him to tell us where it was collected from. Showing you B. And you can't see on this photograph, he said, where it was collected from. But he claimed it was to the right of this little measurement device, this ruler. If Gareth Pursehouse had left Amy Harwick's DNA on this doorknob, or on this door, in this area, then you would have expected to find it here. This is defense triple A. This is the kitchen door that was left open that the prosecution claims Mr. Pursehouse ran out. And if you look closely, you see that this door it requires a doorknob to be opened and a deadbolt to be opened. Yet no DNA was found on this door. It was Amy Harwick who opened that balcony door and left her DNA. It was Amy Harwick who went out on that balcony on her own volition. It was Amy Harwick who, in an attempt to escape Mr. Pursehouse, in a panicked state, screaming, tried to climb over the balcony to get away. Even if Mr. Pursehouse were wearing gloves, that DNA would have been on that kitchen door if it came from him. If the balcony door was, had DNA from those gloves, those gloves still would have been able to transfer DNA on that kitchen door, but there was no DNA there. And that's because Mr. Pursehouse was not the one who left the DNA, Amy Harwick's DNA, on that balcony door. The 
prosecution has a theory they're trying to convince you of, that this nicotine syringe was intended to be used as a weapon, that it was intended to be used as a weapon by Garrett Pursehouse against Amy Harwick. There are several problems with that theory. First, the prosecution was arguing today that Gareth Pursehouse came to acquire that syringe with nicotine after the XBiz Awards. The evidence does not support that. First, it's completely speculative. But we actually have evidence that indicates that syringe was an old syringe, that nicotine in the syringe was dated and old and had started to de decompensate. If you recall, there was testimony from Dr. Benowitz about nicotine. Dr. Benowitz testified that nicotine is a clear substance. It's clear like water. And as it breaks down, it turns darker shades of brown. Here, this nicotine had turned so brown, it was mistaken to be tar heroin by the officers who responded to 2086 Mound. That's how brown this clear liquid had turned. Dr. Benowitz testified it would take months or years for nicotine to break down outside the body. So this nicotine, that's, that is Dr. Benowitz's testimony, that it takes months or years to break down outside of the body. So this syringe containing nicotine would take months to years to turn that brown. This indicates that Gareth Purse has had it for a longer period of time, which means he didn't acquire it to use it against Amy Harwick. He acquired it months or years prior to encountering her. I'm going to object to these facts not in evidence. I can't for this, sir. Right. Sustain. This indicates that this syringe was not intended for Amy Harwick. It indicates he did not acquire it after the XBiz Awards. The color verifies this. The color of this clear liquid had changed over time because it started to break down. The prosecution also wants you to believe this myth that nicotine is somehow undetectable or too difficult and would have been used to commit the perfect crime. But let's look at the circumstances here. First, whether or not it was even intended to be a weapon. How was Gareth Pursehouse supposed to be able to inject her. Dr. Benowitz talked about trying to inject somebody intravenously who's resisting and struggling. The prosecution is trying to manufacture some way for Mr. Pursehouse to have restrained her in order to I, apparently inject her with this syringe. And they even are so desperate that they point to the drawstring on his shorts and try to make a claim that it's somehow a piece of rope or string or something that he could have used, which is ludicrous. They also they also this piece of evidence on Ivar Street behind that empty lot where it was all those trash cans lined up. This tangled web of wires somehow might be evidence in this case. their theory that he was going to untangle this mass of wires and somehow use it? I'm not joking. This takes 
the arguments made. It's ludicrous. This syringe was not to be used on Amy Harwick. It is not an effective weapon unless you have a means of injecting someone intravenously. And even a phlebotomist would have trouble doing that. I know when my daughter was three years old and I had to take her to the doctor for routine immunization, it took three grown adults to restrain her in order to get a shot. Now, I mean, maybe that's not politically correct anymore to admit that you physically restrained your child, but that was the reality. This was not intended to be a weapon. If you look at the syringe, when you are in the jury room, look at the syringe. Look at how long that needle is. The syringe wasn't even completely full. We have to assume that this was brought for some other purpose because it is not a weapon. If Mr. Pursehouse intended to kill Amy Harwick, wouldn't there be a lot of other efficient, meaningful ways to do it other than bringing a syringe? That syringe was intended for somebody else. We know that when Mr. Pursehouse was arrested and he was detained at the Twin Towers facility, he was put on suicide watch. We know that Dr. Benowitz acknowledged that if you do a Google search for nicotine, that you will see literature documenting the use of nicotine for suicide. Objection presented to the court's order. Sustained. Dr. Benowitz testified that a Google search for nicotine will reveal scientific literature validating the use of nicotine in suicide. I'm going to object to this on the court's rule. Well, no, I, I, that court will allow it just for that limited purpose, I think, if the doctor did testify to something to that effect. So, go ahead. And Dr. Benowitz also testified that if you want to commit suicide, the most efficient way to do it using nicotine would be an intravenous injection. I'm going to object that the state's testimony. No, okay, sustained. Let's move on, Kim. Dr. Benowitz talked about the way nicotine is metabolized. And he indicated that if someone tries to kill themselves ingesting nic nicotine orally, it is not an effective way because the way the nicotine is metabolized, it has to go through the stomach first. And people get sick and they throw up. And by throwing up, they release the poison from that, their body, and it's not effective. But Dr. Benowitz acknowledged the most efficient way for the body to metabolize nicotine for a suicide is via an injection. And that, that using it as a reject, as a, using it via an injection means you need a much smaller dosage. Because if you're going to try to kill yourself using an oral dose. Inject, trying to kill yourself. No, it seems like not an evidence. Your Honor, this but is part of the evidence. Well, uh, again, if, 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 you kept it, if you kept it in a general sense, which you were doing, and that the most efficient way of doing it would have been by, 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 uh, uh, by, by use of a needle as opposed to taking it orally, you're right, you would have thrown up and so forth. Keep it in that general sense, the court will allow you to do that. Otherwise, I'll sustain the objection. Okay, well, Dr. Benowitz did testify <clears throat> that the intravenous injection was the most efficient way of whether it's intravenous, intramuscular, um, or taking nicotine by orally, intravenous is the most efficient way to commit suicide. We'll be taking a break soon, ladies and gentlemen. Also, um, um, how much longer do you have, Council? Just a second. It's hard to say, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead for another five minutes. Well, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a break now. Let's go ahead and take 15 minutes if you would.
on the record, uh, Council. I want to continue. Welcome back. An hour and a half flies by when you're having fun, apparently. I'm shocked. Um, I just want to make one last point on the uh, fallacy of this undetectable nicotine. Uh, we had testimony from a criminalist, Philip Nahn, who analyzed, did a narcotics, uh, analyst, an, did a narcotics analysis of the syringe containing the nicotine. It came back negative for any type of controlled substances. However, it was run through this GCMS machine, which compares unknown samples to a library comparing chemical properties of an unknown substance to the chemical properties of known substances which are preserved in a library. And when the results came out showing that there were no controlled substances, other items were detected. And we're going to look at the big numbers over here the right, and this is, I'm showing you defense NN. So the second library run shows nicotine with the highest number of 97. And it shows other items as well. Pyridine, cotinine, which is a metabolite of nicotine. You can hardly say nicotine is an undetectable property when it is so easily discovered by the GCMS, GCMS machine in its analysis when it was only looking for control substances. Now, Dr. Wu testified about his analysis of the nicotine. This nicotine was analyzed by a lot of people. Dr. Bradley, first after LAPD, got this library result. You remember Guy Holloman, who's the supervisor of Philip Nahn at the LAPD lab, suggested that the FBI do the confirmation test to determine what, in fact, was in the syringe, since LAPD did not have a standard or a sample by which to compare the nicotine. So they don't do that. So they sent it to the FBI on Guy Holloman's recommendation, and it was confirmed, because that's what it was. So this is not undetectable. Now, the prosecution, in their examination of uh, other witnesses, brought up the fact that there are these other substances in there. This, this, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly. Pyridine, P-H-R-I-D-I-N-E, has a 97. But Dr. Wu explained when he testified they were only testing for nicotine. And rounding up, they found that the liquid in the syringe contained 87% nicotine. What was the other 13%? Well, it wasn't confirmed because Dr. Wu was only testing for nicotine. But this was not a pure sample. So 13% of the substance inside that nicotine is still unknown to us. But nicotine was detected, and I hope we can lay to rest the fallacy of nicotine being this undetectable substance. The prosecution introduced evidence that Mr. Chris House had on his computer or, or accessed via his computer uh, a device, an external hard drive, that had a file with the name Horphone on it. And the prosecution is trying to get you to believe that the naming of that file is evidence of his hatred and desire to kill Amy Harwick. 
The problem with that is that the naming of that file was done in 2012 and has nothing to do with Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind in 2020. There was a stipulation, and the second line of the stipulation says, the original path file name, which contains Corphone, was created in 2012. So that naming convention was in 2012 when Mr. Pursehouse and Amy Harwick split up and he believed she had cheated on him. The prosecution is trying to get you to speculate as to what happened between Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehouse on the third floor of 2086 Mound. Unfortunately, the prosecution did not obtain the Nest camera audio and video from that evening. And the reason they did not obtain it is because LAPD officers, detectives, who filed a search warrant failed to make a preservation request. And Google only retains Nest video for five days on the type of account Amy Harwick had. You would expect law enforcement in investigating a crime of this magnitude would know that Google does not retain Nest Video indefinitely. And there is an urgency in obtaining this evidence, an urgency and an opportunity to resolve questions that are still outstanding. But the prosecution did not file that preservation request. Even though witnesses such as Robert Koshlin told them, hurry up and get that Nest Video. So when the prosecution claims that the evidence shows one thing or another. Remember, it is their burden of proof. And if the Nest video would have resolved some of these issues, the failure to get that evidence is on the prosecution. And any of ambiguity, ambiguities as a result of the loss of that evidence should result, be resolved in favor of the defense. I'd like to talk to you a bit about some of the jury instructions that you're gonna have and you've already been instructed on. And I'm not going to go through them in detail, but just talking first about first-degree murder. The prosecution has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the killing was first-degree murder rather than a lesser crime. And you're going to be asked to consider lesser crimes in this case. If the people have not met this burden, you must find the defendant not guilty of first-degree murder, and the murder is second-degree murder. Continuing on first-degree murder, deliberation and premeditation. These are the things that the prosecution must prove in order for there to be a finding of first-degree murder. The prosecution must prove that the defendant acted willfully, deliberately and with premeditation. Willfully means he intended to kill. The prosecution has not established that Mr. Pursehouse went to 2086 Mound with the intention to kill <coughs> Amy Harwood. That he... Uh, deliberately, that the defendant carefully weighed the considerations for, I'm sorry, that should be and, against his choice, and knowing the consequences, decided to kill. And premeditation, if he decided to kill before completing the acts that caused death. And then we're gonna go on to the next one which talks about deliberation and premeditation. And this is important because a decision to kill made rashly, impulsively, <coughs> or without careful consideration is not deliberate and premeditated. So if somebody makes a rash decision in the heat of a moment, as opposed to having arrived at that location with the intention to kill, that is insufficient for there to be deliberation and premeditation. 
Let's talk about first degree murder by means of lying in wait. The defendant needs to conceal his purpose from the person killed, wait and watch for an opportunity to act, and then, from a position of advantage, intend to and did make a surprise attack on the person killed. It is not sufficient to merely show the elements of waiting and watching and concealment. The prosecution must prove that the defendant did those physical acts with the intent to take the victim unaware and for the purpose of facilitating an attack. And the prosecution has not shown, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Mr. Pursehouse went to 2086 Mount Street in order to attack or harm Amy Harwick. Provocation for second degree murder. Provocation reduces a murder from first degree to second degree when provocation raises a reasonable doubt about premeditation or deliberation. If you conclude the defendant committed murder but was provoked, consider the provocation in deciding whether the crime was first or second degree murder. And let me say this. Provocation is not defined as some that does not require that the person provoked be provoked in a way which requires them to act in self-defense. The type of provocation we're talking about is any type of provocation that causes someone to get into an emotional state, emotional state that disrupts their ability to premeditate and to deliberate. And going back to the deliberation, Deliberation requires that someone carefully weigh the considerations for and against his choice and knowing the consequence decide to kill. So someone who acts under the heat of a moment as opposed to somebody who actually premeditates willfully and deliberately is not first degree murder. Provocation to get to second degree murder. Provocation reduces a murder from first degree to second degree when provocation raises a reasonable doubt about premeditation or deliberation. If you conclude that the defendant committed murder but was provoked, consider the provocation in deciding whether the crime was first or second degree murder. The provocation, again, is an emotional state created by the circumstances surrounding the person's decision making. A killing that would otherwise be murder is reduced to voluntary manslaughter if the defendant killed someone because of a sudden quarrel or heat of passion. Heat of passion can be any violent or intense emotion that causes a person to act without due deliberation and reflection. So violent or intense emotions are exactly the type of emotions that cause someone to be considered provoked for the purpose of second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter. Sufficient provocation may occur over a short or long period of time. So in determining whether Gareth Pursehouse was suffering under the type of emotional strain and emotional state of being that predated running into Amy Harwick, you can consider the totality of the years of burden he was carrying, all of the years of emotions he was carrying, and deciding his mental state and finding that there was provocation in this case. Well, sufficient provocation can occur over a short or long period of time, and you're entitled to consider his state of mind as he explained it to Amy Harwick in their text message exchange. Uh, object using the state of mind again as actual evidence of defendant's intent. intent. <clears throat> the prosecution has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not kill as the result of a sudden quarrel or in the heat of passion. 
if the prosecution has not met this burden, you must find the defendant not guilty of murder. You do not, regarding the lying in wait special circumstance, you do not need to even consider the special circumstance allegation if you find the defendant not guilty of first degree murder and guilty of second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter. The lying in wait special circumstance has additional elements. It requires an intentional killing committed while lying in wait. And a person commits murder by lying in wait when they conceal their purpose from the person killed, they watch and wait for an opportunity to act, and then with a surprise attack on the person killed, from a position of advantage, they intend to kill the person by taking them by surprise. So this requires that the person committing a surprise attack actually intend to kill the person. Here, we did not have a surprise attack. Here, we did not have the intention by Mr. Pursehouse to harm or kill Amy Harwick. And finally, burglary also requires, in this case, that Mr. Pursehouse entered 2086 Mound with the intent to commit murder. Given that Mr. Pursehouse did not intend to commit first degree murder, the only way you could convict Mr. Pursehouse of burglary is if you find him guilty of second degree murder, if you find him guilty of voluntary manslaughter, the burglary count cannot be found to be true. Finally, circumstantial evidence. This is important because if you can draw two or more reasonable conclusions from the circumstantial evidence in this case, and one of those reasonable conclusions supports the finding of not guilty or an untrue finding, you must conclude the allegation was not proved by the circumstantial evidence. And I want to talk the last instruction about flight, because the prosecution is claiming that Garrett Pursehouse, by running away from 2086 Mound, showed consciousness of guilt. And I want to talk about what flight really means. If Garrett Pursehouse was at Amy Harwick's home with the intention to speak to her and not to harm her. And things went terribly wrong and she fell to her death and he never intended to harm her. That would create a situation in which he would have a fight or flight response, a typical physiological reaction to any type of stressful event, which is something we've seen in this case. Michael Herman had this response. He ran. I believe the evidence supports the conclusion that Amy Harwick had this fight or flight response, and she ran for the balcony railing. And Gareth Pursehouse is no different. Having things go sideways and go end up with a terrible result, it's not inconsistent with an innocent state of mind to run in panic. But you also have to consider that actual professionals did not attend to Amy Harwick when they encountered her lying on the pavement. Actual professionals who were trained, <clears throat> LAPD officers, did not attend to Amy Harwick in a way to try to help with her injuries. Because the injuries were so severe that no layperson could do anything. And even the paramedics acted very deliberately and cautiously in treating Amy Harwick. So it's unfair for the prosecution to only assume that Mr. Pursehouse's reaction in running from 2086 Mound leads to a finding of consciousness of guilt. Now, if Mr. Pursehouse had planned this, as the prosecution claims, you would expect Mr. Pursehouse to actually flee. This is a man with means to be able to run from detection by police. This is a man with money in the bank. He could have gone to his brother's house in San Diego. He could have crossed the border to Mexico. He could have, flo he could have flown. He could have literally flown away. I'm going to object on this speculation. Uh, I'll allow it. And he did not. Mr. Pursehouse knew there were signs of forced entry 
at 2086 Mound. Mr. Pursehouse knew he was on the next door neighbor's ring video. Mr. Pursehouse knew he had made a scene at the XBiz Awards that was not going to go undetected if some harm came to Amy Harwick. And what did Mr. Pursehouse do? He stayed home. He didn't leave. He waited. He waited for what he knew was coming, the inevitable arrest. He did not flee. Not only that, the prosecution is claiming they found evidence in his home to tie him to what happened at 2086 Mound. They found a syringe, the same type of syringe, in the kitchen. They found gloves, which they say to you today may be the same gloves. Mr. Pursehouse didn't dispose of this evidence. If Gareth Pursehouse's plan all along was to kill Amy Harwick, wouldn't you expect him to try to evade the authorities instead of staying home, making no attempt to flee, no attempt to escape? He stayed home at the address on his driver's license where he was arrested. On February 14th, 2020, Gareth Pursehouse went to 2086 Mount Street because he lost control of his overwhelming emotions. Breaking into 2086 Mount Street was an impulsive decision. He impulsively broke into Amy Harwick's home in the heat of his emotions in a desperate attempt to talk to Amy Harwick. He believed there was only one way forward for him, to talk to her, to get her to release him from his agonizing pain of unresolved grief due to their breakup. He had regrets he needed to share with her. There were things left unsaid at the Expos Awards that he still needed to say. He needed to be heard and understood. His actions were not carefully considered Instead, his actions were the result of rash, impulsive, and erratic thoughts brought to the forefront by his emotional state. Her death was never his goal. Her death would not alleviate his pain. He needed to talk to her. The intensity of his devotion to her was terrifying to him. We agree. Gareth Pursehouse had no business being in her home, but that doesn't mean he is guilty of first degree murder or of lying in wait or the lying in wait special circumstance. What likely happened that night is that when Gareth was in the house, Amy came home, and we don't know what time she came home. We don't know what time she arrived at 2086 Mound, and we don't know what time she walked in. All we know is she got a text message about 102. 101 a.m. But we don't know where she was exactly when she got that message. We do know her phone was on her bed. We don't know where in her house Gareth Purse house was at that time when she was on the third floor. We don't know if he was downstairs and came up the main stairwell to the third floor. We don't know if he was already on the third floor. Nest camera video would have been helpful to make that determination, but we don't have that. Michael Herman testified that he awoke to the sound of Amy screaming, and at first he thought it was a mouse. The screaming didn't stop, so he started to wonder something was wrong. He said the only time, other time he'd heard someone scream like that is when somebody had seen a mouse. So he shouts up, he screams out, as loud as he can, Amy. And then he says things change. Before, her screams were staying in one place. She wasn't being jostled. There was no movement. But after he heard Amy, 
Then he started hearing the shuffling he described. He heard two bodies go to the ground. We don't know who initiated the physical confrontation. You might assume that because Gareth Pursehaus was the larger person, he did it, but we can't make assumptions when it's the prosecution's burden to prove this case beyond all reasonable doubt. It is just as likely, if not likelier, that after Amy had spoken to Michael Herman about this person, about increasing security in her home, and making Michael Herman aware that this person might be somebody that sh to be concerned about, that they came up, that it was in her mind at least, that Michael Herman, by shouting up Amy, was on his way to come render her assistance. And she preemptively attacked Gareth Pursehaus in order to subdue him because she was afraid of him. Without an opportunity to know why he came, she preemptively attacked him. A struggle resulted from this interaction. We don't know how it began exactly, but we do know that she was screaming for quite some time, minutes, Michael Herman said, while he fumbled around before he screamed up Amy. And if Gareth Pursehaus had intended to attack Amy Harwick, why wait while she screamed? Why not attack her immediately? And the answer to that is because he didn't intend to attack her. her screams, her fear, it's an understandable response. But that does not mean Gareth Pursehaus had any intention to harm her. In his voicemail, in the texts they exchange, even in their conversation at the Exbiz Awards, Gareth Pursehaus made no threats of physical violence against Amy Harwick. The fact is that he was triggered by this series of events, triggered to the point where he felt he had no choice but to go to 2086 Mount Street to show Amy Harwick in the most dramatic fashion he could. His pain was real and convinced her he needed to speak to her. The evidence unequivocally shows that Gareth Pursehaus was a man in crisis. He was struggling. He was struggling to deal with the emotional fallout. He was grappling with in the years after his breakup with Amy Harwick. And when he saw her at the Expos Awards, that dam he had built to try to repress all of his pain and all of his emotions, that dam burst and the floodwaters were released and he could no longer control the tsunami of his emotions. Prosecution has not proven that Gareth Pursehaus went there to kill or harm Amy Harwick. The prosecution has not proven he deliberately caused her to fall over the balcony railing. Prosecution has not disproven that Gareth Pursehaus was acting due to his emotional provocation, nor have they disproven he acted in the heat of passion. For these reasons, we ask you to return a just and proper verdict in this case. We ask you to find Gareth Pursehaus not guilty of first degree murder and not guilty of the lying in wait special circumstance. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Mm -hmm. Coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, if this runs over a little bit, is that a problem? Just so we can finish today. Is that all right? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Yes. I promise I won't speak for as long as Ms. Ferguson Lab or Ms. Rabela. So I'll get you out of here as soon as possible. Now, as Ms. Bernstein Lev gives her closing argument, I know I want to remind you, jurors, that during opening statement, when Mr. Frenzel gave his opening statement. He gave a pretty different story of what you were going to hear during this trial. He stated that during this trial, case. Opening statement is not evidence. Uh, Overruled. Uh, counsel, you may continue. Like I said, during his opening statement, he stated that 
the defendant went over to Amy's house with the intent to kill himself. And that, when a struggle ensued, Amy, on her own volition, climbed over a three and a half foot balcony and fell to her death. Now, you heard a different story here by Ms. Bernstein Lev. And that story is Honor, that the defendant to, just. I'm going to object to the um, reference to suicide based on the court's prior rulings. Well, no, I, I think it cuts both ways. I'm going to allow counsel to continue. Now, in this instance, when Ms. Bernstein Love gave her argument, you heard something different. She said that the defendant went to Amy's house out of a sense of desperation just to talk to her. And that it was Amy that physically initiated an aggressive struggle between the two of them, and that she climbed over the balcony and fell to her death. Now, it's important to note about these different versions of events that each of the defense attorneys has presented to you is that it's a story. That's all, that's all it is. A story concocted by the defense has, has absolutely no basis in fact. Or if you again. Like I said, the different version of events the defense is giving you is simply that, a story. A story concocted by the defense with absolutely no basis in You're fact. That's improper argument. And well, absolutely no basis. Concocted by the defense is improper argument. Uh, well. You, you may take it as such, but it, in, uh, in so many words, uh, the prosecution's version of what occurred, I think, was also attacked by the defense in their closing, so you may continue. I'm going to try to finish my sentence one more time. Each version of the events the defense attorneys have given you is simply a story. A story concocted by the defense that has absolutely no basis in fact, nor is it supported by the evidence. Now, members of the jury, as jurors in this case, it's up to you to decide what happened in this case. You decide the facts based on the witnesses that you heard, based on the evidence that's been admitted, and based on what you heard throughout this entire trial. And then it's also your job to apply the law to the facts that you've determined. Now, I tell you that the evidence that you've heard throughout this trial establishes the prosecution's theory of this case. And that is that the defendant came to Amy's house with the intent to kill her when he brought that loaded syringe with a lethal dose of nicotine, that he broke into her home, that he took her by surprise, beat her up, strangled her, and then dropped her over the balcony to her death. That's what the evidence establishes in this case. Unlike what the defense told you, it's not a story. It's based on fact, it's based on evidence. Now I told you about your duty as jurors to determine what happened in this case and how to apply the law. But there's something else that I want you guys to think about when you go back into the deliberation room and just some pitfalls that I want to warn you about. And that is wanting more. I think I touched about I touched on this in Vaud here just a little bit. We talked about that burglary analogy I used of the car. But it's natural. As human beings, we always want to know more. More background, more witnesses, more police reports. Even though it's natural to think that way, you have to base your decision and deliberation process on what you're turning from actual evidence. Jurors said to play this what if thing. What if Amy arrived at the hospital earlier? You know, what if there were more Nest videos? What if the defendant changed his mind? I mean, these questions were specifically answered in trial. Right? Dr. Luzzi said if Amy was right outside of the OR, probably wouldn't have made a difference. If there were more Nest videos, we didn't have any. The police did everything they had, could to get all the Nest videos that Ms. Farley possessed. And based on the defendant's conduct before, during, and after the murder, he never changed his mind. But nonetheless, don't engage in that what-if thing. Don't speculate. And we'll get, get to this later on in my argument, but that is exactly what Ms. Bernstein Lev is having you do. Speculate, speculate, speculate. Based on misstatements on the law and misstatement of the evidence that you heard in the actual trial. Don't make it personal. We all come from different backgrounds. We all have different unique experiences. And I think there's a tendency to think, if I were the victim, I would have done this. If I were the defendant, 
I would have done this. I caution you from doing that. Instead, again, listen to the evidence and base your decision on the evidence you heard in trial. Refusing to deliberate with other jurors. Now again, you can only come to a decision if all of you agree. So remember, this is a collaborative process. Now, I don't think that none of you or any of you would decide to not deliberate or get along, but remember to keep an open mind and respect each other's opinions. Using the possible doubt standard. Look, you can have some doubt about non-issues in this case. Again, there's always going to be unanswered questions. But do not hold us, Mr. Avila and I, to an impossible burden. Do not hold us to a burden that's beyond a shadow of doubt, beyond any imaginary doubt, because as the jury instructions specifically say, anything in life is subject to some possible or imaginary doubt. The standard of proof in this case is beyond a reasonable doubt. Verdict forms. They can be confusing, so I'm just going to touch on it really quick. It's just, if you find the defendant is guilty of burglary, you fill out that verdict form, you then have to decide whether or not there was a person present. If you find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder, you fill out that verdict form, and then you must determine whether or not the special circumstance of lying and wait is true or not true. Voluntary manslaughter, heat of passion. Now, there are some misstatements about what the law actually states in this Bernstein and Les argument. So I'm going to go through this very carefully. The elements of this crime, the heat of passion, or a killing done in the heat of passion, is the following. One, the defendant was provoked. Two, as a result of the provocation, the defendant acted rashly and under the influence of intense emotion that obscured his judgment. Three, that the, prov the provocation would have caused a person of average disposition to act rashly and without deliberation, that is, from passion rather than judgment. Some key points I want to take, or I want to point to you, point out to you in regards to this specific jury instruction. While there's no specific type of provocation required, slight or remote provocation is not sufficient. Not sufficient. The defendant is not allowed to set up his own standard of conduct. Consider whether a person of average, average disposition in the same position, knowing the same facts, would, re would have reacted from passion rather than from judgment. That being said, I'm going to give you examples of what is not voluntary manslaughter, or what is not provocation. It's not enough that a person is mad. It's not enough that a person is upset. It's not enough that a person is desperate. It's not enough that a person is sad. Or it is not an argument or a fight that went bad. That is not provocation. So there has to be some sort of trigger, a provoking act, and that provocation would have caused a person of average, again, average disposition to act rationally and without due deliberation that is from passion rather than from judgment. And don't let the defense confuse you with the use of the word passion. Just because this person you left used that word repeatedly doesn't mean you adopt the meaning that Ms. Bernstein left is giving you. There is a legal meaning that qualifies as passion under the law. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about just this tenet of killing in the heat of passion. It's an incredibly important part of our law. It allows for the mitigation of the killing of one human being based on heat of passion. I'll give you an example. Let's say, walk in on your child being sexually assaulted and that person is killed. Another instance, someone discovers that an immediate family member was just murdered and that person kills the perpetrator. Now in those specific situations, any normal person of average and normal disposition would be so overwhelmed with emotion, so overcome by anger, and passion, 
that would drive that person to use deadly force and kill them. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a killing done it in the heat of passion. Let me tell you what's not an example of a heat of passion killing. Let's say there's a man who runs into someone who ridiculed him and mocked him for years in high school, making his life a living hell. And he runs into him years later and decides to kill him. Now that killing was done out of a desire to get back at that guy for the years of torment. That was a killing done out of revenge. That is not a heat of passion killing. That is not voluntary manslaughter. Now, similar in this case, you have the defendant who is now claiming that he was provoked by Amy and that he killed her out of the heat of passion. The defendant, after running into her, after breaking up with her or the relationship ending nearly nine years prior and running into her at the Eggs Biz Awards, he then kills her a month later. That is not a heat of passion killing. Like I said, he can't now claim that Amy provoked him when he's the one that broke into her home. When he's the one who broke, who provoked a physical struggle between himself and the victim. It does not justify him going to her house, uninvited, breaking in, beating her, strangling her, and then tossing her over a balcony. That is not justified under the law. That is not heat of passion as defined by the law. Now I want to talk to you about assuming just for argument's sake, just for a second, that we believe the defense is arguing. That we believe, you know what? Amy was a person who was initially aggressive with the defendant. Let's just pretend that that's what happened for one second. Okay? Well, if that's the case, Amy was perfectly within her right to defend herself in her own home. Especially when you take into account her state of mind at the time of this incident. Specifically when you consider what happened at the ex biz awards between the defendant and Amy. This email, which has been shown by both Mr. Avila and Ms. Bernstein, I'm going to go through it really quickly, really goes to show not just what happened at the ex biz awards, but how it truly made Amy feel. Now, Ms. Lev came up here and talked about this email, and she entirely focused this email as to, again, how the defendant feels. How he must have been feeling when he saw Amy. But this email was written by Amy. Not only does it talk about her fear, but it talks about just how angry, not desperate, angry the defendant was at the ex she starts the email with, tonight I felt very scared. That is the first thing she types up in that email when she comes home later that morning from the ex-biz awards. He says, Garrett came up behind me and started screaming, why are you here? He looked dysregulated and his eyes looked out of control. He started screaming, you don't even like porn, you shouldn't be here, why are you here? He looked like he was going to cry. He was breathing heavily, flailing his arms around. I didn't want to make a scene or scare anybody else. She goes on. We sat close by the bathrooms. I made sure to look and make sure there were both security people and a lot of attendees very close by. She was so scared, even at the ex Awards, that when he, she pulled him aside, she wanted to make sure she was around other people and security guards. I was scared and felt like I needed to neutralize the situation. I mean, Amy's a wonderful person. Her ex-boyfriend from eight, nearly nine years prior to that, is screaming at her, and she takes it upon herself to try to calm him down and neutralize the situation. He told me he lost his job. Continues on. What's important to note here in the second sentence, second sentence is he couldn't stop obsessing over me. He recited text messages that I had sent 
from this time frame about nine years ago, recited the date, who they were to, and exactly what they said, word for word. I couldn't believe it. Again, I was very scared. She ends the email, I'm pretty nervous that I'm more on his radar now. It terrifies me that he's obsessed with me for nine years. He thinks about me every day, can't move on, cries, and despite what Ms. Bernstein said about Fernando Chavez making up the word tantrum, she says in her own email, and throws tantrums in this way. He's focused on harming me. I'm hoping that this interaction and listening and giving him time may cause a neutralization in his anger towards me. Now, you don't have to just take Amy's word for what happened at the ex Biz Awards. You can take a look at Hernando Chavez's testimony as well as Aspen Jameson. Remember, Aspen Jameson has no stake in the game. She doesn't know the victim. She doesn't know the defendant. They both came in here and testified. Dr. Chavez said, you ruined my life, you bitch. He heard the defendant say that. Ms. Jameson, again, who has zero stake in the game, isn't friends with either of the parties involved, says she heard something to the effect of, you fucking ruined my life. And if you recall her testimony, she stated that she heard the defendant not only screaming at her, but cursing her. So that anger was definitely was definitely apparent. Now, like I said, this encounter at the ex Biz Awards wasn't just a display of the defendant's anger, but really it demonstrated just how terrified Amy was of the defendant. And we know this based upon other things. Not only did the encounter at the ex Biz Awards scare Amy, but so did the repeated attempts by the defendant to contact her the very next day after the ex Biz Awards, where the defendant admits to looking up her phone number and finding her. He then texts her. Amy, being nice, tries to neutralize the situation as she did at the awards, says, I'm glad we had a chance to speak. Sounds like you both need to express and hear some things from the other person. Miss, uh, the defendant goes on to say, not sure if you're done. Because you said, how did we finish this now last night? But if we can meet again, he wants to see her again. And how does Amy react? Amy, again, takes a very neutral position in trying to calm the defendant down. I think it was really good that we were able to speak last night. I'm sure there's a lot more that you want to process and say to me, but I think that was a lot for both of us. I hope you were able to hear me last night when I said that I was sorry for anything that caused you suffering and that I give you and that I forgive you for the things that you did to me. I think right now it's best to have some space and I don't mean that in a negative way. The past is sad and triggering for both of us. I think we ended our talk last night well. We can be civil from a distance, respect each other and move forward with our own lives. You know, Amy politely tells him that she doesn't want to communicate with him anymore. That she doesn't want him back in her life. But the defendant doesn't take a hit. He doesn't take no for an answer. He again emails her, I'm sorry, texts her two hours later. This tirade, so you're still gone, which is exactly my nightmare. It's sadly what I expected. So on and so forth. We saw this text message earlier, so I'm not going to reread it. He goes on again. Further to text her, I don't know how busy you are, and it truly scares me so much more than I could possibly convey to say this. Please just, please don't just vanish on me. Please, please don't let me go through that again. Again, reaching out to her, begging for her to be back in his life. No response by Amy. Again, he texts her almost, almost five hours later, please call me. Again, no response by Amy. The next day, he even leaves a voicemail for Amy. Again, also, Amy decides not to respond. She's done. She wants no more contact with the defendant. 
And this repeated effort by the defendant to reach out to her only further scares her more. And you know this from all of the conversations she had with her friends. She tells Fernando Chavez that Gareth found her number online and messaged her. She says, I told him I didn't want to talk and wished him the best, but his response was still obsessive and scared. She talks about a handyman coming in to put more locks on the windows and that she actually got pepper spray. She said that he sounds unstable because he keeps texting her. She talks to Robert Koshler, who she also describes to him about running into the defendant at the ex visit boards, about how he acted really crazy and how he's obsessed with her. She he's ends, I'm sorry, she ends the text message by saying, I took safety measures today, or realistically scared for my safety. My, I, my anxiety is in bad now, I just realistically think something could happen to me. During her dinner and walk with Sarah Rollins, she specifically tells her, and you heard her testify, that Amy was scared of what he might do to harm her or her clients. She texts Marcy Mendoza, I had to block Gareth. He continues to message me after I told him I did not want to have contact. He even said that you sent your psychic energy to control the Star Trek episode that he's watching that reminded him of me. This is really scary. Do you notice the word scary or the word scary? How many times has Amy used that to describe the defendant's conduct? To Grace Stanley. I'm more concerned about my safety right now with your situation. I blocked him through text message, but because of his level of obsession, and I definitely don't think I'm in the clear. I have pepper spray at the house now, my roommate is on alert, I'm upping my home security cameras. So what do you take from all of this? Okay? If we assume that the argument that defense counsel is posing to you, that Amy was initially aggressive with the defendant, when she ran into him into her house, at her house, she was deathly afraid of the, def of the defendant at this time. So it's no shock that she was unhappy to see him when she goes up the stairs and sees him waiting in this dark TV media room for her and takes her by surprise. She made very clear that she wanted nothing to do with him, didn't want to see him, and wanted absolutely no contact with him. And she's terrified of him. And that's what she sees when she comes home at around one in the morning on Valentine's Day to see the defendant, 6'4", 230, fit and buff, standing or sitting or waiting for her in that dark TV media room. How do you think she's gonna react? She's absolutely entitled to defend herself in her own home. The defendant's obsession with Amy does not justify his actions. His renewed anger towards her when seeing her at the ex Biz Awards doesn't justify his actions. And this intense desire to have Amy back in his life also doesn't justify his actions. Now, members of the jury, I want to talk to you about the passion in this last sentence here. Is that based on everything I told you, the defendant can't now claim that he killed Amy in the heat of passion, and that Amy provoked him. He cannot create his own standard of conduct. But when it was him that broke in her home, took her by surprise, beat her up, strangled her, and then killed her. That is not how the law of voluntary manslaughter works. I want to talk to you about provocation. Now, provocation can indeed reduce murder from first degree to second degree. But in this instance, the evidence establishes that there's no provocation in this case. Now, I've discussed provocation in the context of voluntary manslaughter, but now I want to talk about provocation in the context of the crime of murder. 
And there's just simply no provocation in this instance. In fact, the evidence establishes that not only was there no provocation, but the defendant acted with intent to kill Amy. And he did so with premeditation and deliberation. So there can't be provocation here. The defendant planned this. He prepared for this. He intended to kill her all along. Now, the defense will have you believe, again, that Amy, on her own volition, climbed over this balcony to get away from the defendant. And during trial, they alluded to some damage on the awning, that perhaps she tried to reach underneath that awning to leverage herself and scale down to a third-story building. Look, you've heard a lot of things about Amy in this trial. She's smart. She's intelligent. She's beautiful. She's a therapist. She has her PhD. She's admittedly fit and athletic. But what you didn't hear is that Amy Harwick is Spider-Man. Okay, and I say this not to be funny, but because that's exactly what the defense will have you believe. They will have you believe that she climbed over the balcony to get away from the defendant and sailed down her third-story house. That's what they'll have you believe. Not only is that nonsensical, but it's completely unreasonable. And in the words of Ms. Bernstein Webb, that's what's ludicrous. And I'll tell you why. If she was trying to scale down her building, hanging, I'm sorry, her balcony, hanging from, the, hanging from it, you know, reaching her feet under there, well, she would have fallen in a completely different way. Okay? And we heard from Dr. Luzi's injuries that Amy Harwick had. She had injuries to her head. And the one injury to her head that's important is that she had a subdural hemorrhage on the right side of her head. She had a fracture to her scapula. Her pelvis was shattered, causing the severe liver lacerations and internal injuries to her kidney. That means she fell onto her pelvis and then onto her right side. Now she also had injuries to her face. Irrespective of the nasal fracture that Dr. Luzi saw on her face, she also had other injuries that were evidence of her being beat up by the defendant. Injuries around her facial area, which is marked by the diagram on the left, as well as injuries to her hands and arms, which are also documented on the diagram to the right, which are admitted into evidence. Now, if she had fallen from hanging from the balcony, perhaps to break or fall with her hands, you would have seen fractures or completely different set of injuries to her hands and arms. If she landed on her feet, she would have had injuries to her legs, broken feet, or I'm sorry, fractures to her legs, fractures to her feet. If she fell face first, you would have had a wide pattern of injuries, like the subdural hemorrhage that Dr. Luzi talked about on the stand. Her injuries themselves do not support the contention that she was trying to get down from the balcony and happened to fall. Now, another reason why this is a completely nonsensical, sort of ludicrous version of events is think about it. You heard how Michael Herman, when he heard the struggle, yelled out, hey, motherfucker. Now, you heard also from Dr. Luzi that due to the strikes that she had to the head, due to the strangulation based on both the internal and external examination of Amy Harwood, it was likely that she was unconscious. It only takes 15 or 20 seconds to render someone unconscious from strangling them. And Ms. Bernstein Lev can try to undermine the strangulation issue with Michael Herman as much as she wants. The fact that she was strangled is not based on just what Michael Herman heard about choking. And there is a misstatement by Ms. Bernstein Lev during her closing argument. That is not the first time that Michael Herman talked about hearing Amy Harwick being choked. In fact, he called officers, detectives, on February 17th saying, I remember more. And when they interview him on February 20th, he talks about how he heard Amy being choked. And he testified at preliminary hearing that he heard that Amy was being choked. And he heard that during redirect by Mr. Avila during trial. But irrespective of what uh, Michael Herman had to say, we know she was strangled because 
of the autopsy photos that you saw because of the testimony that Dr. Luzi talked about. And he talked about he, that she was either unconscious or in such a weakened state because of her energy being expended after being strangled by the defendant. So is the defense saying that after being unconscious or in a weakened state, Amy thought to herself, you know what? The best way to get away from this guy is to jump over or climb over the balcony and scale down the building like Spider-Man or run towards the stairs towards my screaming roommate to get away from the defendant. It just doesn't make sense that someone who is either unconscious or in such a weak state would choose to go over the balcony and scale the building versus running downstairs towards her screaming roommate towards help. It just does not make sense. Now I talked about how there's no provocation in this case and that the defendant acted with premeditation and deliberation when he intended to kill Amy Harwick. And we know this based on his actions. It makes it apparent that he was planning to commit this murder and that on the night of February 14th, 2020, he took deliberate steps to carry out this very murder. The first is we know that he went from his house in Kabora Street, Playa del Rey, to Amy's home in the Hollywood Hills. That's what, 16 miles. In LA, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes to get there. And that whole time, he never turned around. He never thought, you know what, this is a really bad idea. I'm just gonna stay home on Valentine's Day. No, in that 20 minutes, he makes the affirmative decision that I'm going to go and kill. I'm on a mission. I'm going to go and kill Amy Harwood. When he gets there, he doesn't park in front of Amy's house. I mean, if you just want to talk to her, why don't you just park in front of her house, right? No, he decides to park somewhere around Ivar Street and Vine. And instead of just walking to the front door like a normal person or wait for her outside, he climbs up this hill behind Amy's neighbor's house to access <coughs> Amy's house. Now let's just pause for a moment. How does the defendant even know where Amy lives? How does he know that by climbing up this hill he's gonna be able to get into Amy's house? That's because he had to do his own independent research and figure out not only where she lived, but the access points to her house, the neighboring properties, and the neighboring streets. That is preparation. That is planning for a murder. In addition to climbing up this hill, he goes and lands here, the neighbor's landing. And when doing that, I mean, he's dressed for this mission. He's dressed to kill. He's wearing a hat to cover his head. He's wearing gloves. He has that rope or string tied around his shorts. And on his person, person he's carrying that syringe loaded with a lethal dose of nicotine. Now, why wear these items, right? The hat, obviously, to cover your head. The string around his waist. I mean, they, they found those shorts or something that looks like those shorts at the defendant's house. And those shorts already have, like, a black drawstring inside. So we know it's not, it's not wearing that to keep his pants up. <coughs> That's a tool that he wanted to use in implementing the murder, whether that be to tie me up, use it to strangle her, what have you. And the gloves. Why would anybody wear gloves? If you want to talk to Amy, why are you wearing gloves? What's the purpose of that? It's clearly not a very cold night. He's wearing shorts out late at night or in the middle of the night. Why are you wearing gloves? It's so that you don't leave your fingerprints behind. It's so you don't leave your DNA behind. So that you don't leave any trace of yourself behind so that you can be ID later in a crime that you just committed. All of this is preparation. So let's talk about the syringe. Now, according to defense, he just brought this syringe for some other purpose. It wasn't to kill Amy Harwick, it was for something else. But members of the jury, let's straighten something out right now about some misstatements that Ms. Bernstein left, said. This is not a syringe the defendant possessed for months and years as evidenced by the color. 
And according to the testimony, it was very specific. Dr. Maureen Bradley's testimony, which was read into the record, as well as Dr. Renowitz's testimony, talks about that the color may change when there's exposure to the elements. Things like being out on a balcony because of the exposure to the air, or just simply being stored in a syringe can affect the color of nicotine. But the breakdown which Ms. Bernstein Lev talks to you about is something different. The breakdown of nicotine outside of the body can take years, it can take months. Now, if that's true, well, that's not true in this case because we heard from Dr. Wu who tested this syringe over a year after this crime happened in July of 2022. That syringe still contained about 87% nicotine. That was the purity level of this specific syringe. And as that Dr. Benowitz testified, that is a lethal dose of nicotine in that syringe. Now, why bring that? You know, Ms. Bernstein loves correct. This is not like a typical weapon you see when murders are committed. It's not a gun, it's not a knife, but it is a weapon of choice by the defendant and it was chosen on purpose. Now, he had to do some work. He had to do his due diligence in determining this weapon, right? He was able to, to do his due diligence and find out that how much of nicotine would needed to be used in order to kill someone. How would you administer it? You know, how much do you need of this substance to actually be able to kill someone? He had to find out all of those questions before arming himself with this weapon. And in conducting this due diligence, he was able to even determine that this poison, this poison of choice that he used, is undetected by ordinary laboratories from local law enforcement. That it needs special testing to be detected in someone's bloodstream or in someone's body. And contrary to what Ms. Bernstein Love says, you don't have to inject this to kill someone intravenously. You could do, do it intramuscular, it, through intramuscular. I mean, you could poke anybody, anywhere in their body, for them to die from this lethal dose of nicotine. It doesn't have to be directly into the, into the bloodstream. So why bring this? The intent here is to kill Amy Harwick with it. When you look at the syringe, as well as, all, as well as all of the other steps of preparation the defendant took, it goes to show his intent to kill, and he did it with premeditation and deliberation. What else? He covers the cameras when he gets to the landing, landing, two different cameras for 10 seconds to stop the recording, stop the motion of those cameras from capturing him. Now, if you just want to talk to someone, why do you care whether your identification shows up in somebody else's cameras? That doesn't make any sense. If he didn't intend to kill Amy Harwick or had no ill intent towards her, then why do this? And then he climbs that chain link fence and then breaks into Amy's house. If he wants to talk to her, why do you have to break into her house? Wait outside, leave her a note. Send her another five text messages and voicemails. Why break into her home? Then he breaks into her home, goes upstairs where he's lying in wait for nearly four hours till Amy gets home. And remember, the defendant is 6'4", 230, and pretty muscular and a fit guy, and he's waiting for her in her home in the dark. This is a picture from the body-worn video of Officer Fissett, and that's how it looked when they arrived. So he's waiting in the dark for her. I mean, I watched Monday Night Football last night, and that takes, what, about three or four hours? So he was waiting just as long as it took me to watch a football game, including timeouts and TV commercials. That's how long he was waiting for her before he killed her. And in those four hours, the defendant never decided to change his mind. He's not, he didn't decide to go home and say, this is a really bad idea. He didn't decide to go outside, wait on the curb for her. None of that. He stayed upstairs on the third story of Amy's home till she came home so that she could kill her. Premeditation deliberation. Now admittedly, the defendant didn't kill Amy by injecting her with nicotine. That was his original plan. Now just because he didn't kill her in the way he originally intended to kill her, 
Does it mean that he didn't possess the intent to kill, that he didn't kill her with premeditation and deliberation? Now, it's okay that there's a different method of murder here. His intent was very clear. He carried the syringe into the home. He prepared for that murder with the way he was dressed, with his actions. And when Michael Herman yells, hey, motherfucker, he's essentially the one that thwarts the original plan. As you heard in evidence, you know, she was beating up Amy. He was strangling her to the point of unconsciousness or a, sub, a very weakened state. And when the defendant says, hears Michael Herman yell, hey, motherfucker, from these stairs, he reacts. He decides to pick up Amy and drop her over the balcony to her death because he does this on purpose. He doesn't want her to live to be able to implicate him in any of his crimes. And then he immediately runs away. Now, I want to talk to you about the defendant's wife. And like Mr. Avila said, I'm going to echo this. His conduct, the defendant's conduct before, during, and after the murder speak volumes to his guilt. It speaks volumes to his intent. Now, if we're to assume from the defense that it was Amy that initially provoked him into this fight and that she on her own went over this balcony, why is it that he just flees the scene? There's a jury instruction specifically to this point. If the defendant fled, that conduct may show that he was aware of his guilt. He runs outside the side door of the kitchen and out from when she came, which is the chain link fence, and we know that from ring videos. And in order to do that, he has to run just by Amy's body. It looks farther than the photograph, but as Dr. Uh, Mr. Avila talked about, it's very close. In order to jump that fence and go back to the neighbor's property, you're going to see Amy's body. So this man who allegedly loves her, is so desperate to talk to her, cares for her, runs by her lifeless body on the pavement. He doesn't go to render her aid. I mean, if he was just there to talk to her and she fell on her own, why run away? Why not go and help her and see if she's okay? Why not go talk to Michael Herman and explain yourself? Call 911, call an ambulance, call the police, do something. His decision was to run away and leave her to die. That goes to show his guilt. Something else that goes to, goes to show his guilt is that within 46 minutes of committing this murder, let's just say within an hour of committing this murder, he decides to reach out to a girl he met on a dating app, Natasha Paulson, to res respond to a text message that she sent hours earlier. Ha, 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 that's funny. I mean, the defendant's a cold-blooded murderer, right? You literally just took someone's life. Yet, the first thing you do within an hour of murdering that person, of watching her die, is to text some random woman that you just met on a dating app? I don't object. Watching her die, that's... Uh-oh. Well, she was not dead. The next morning after the murder... What does he decide to do? At around 11 a.m., he texts Angela G. Morning, sun, morning sunshine, what are you up to? And then proceeds to hang out with her for a few hours until she's arrested. Again, he's either trying to plan an alibi witness or he really doesn't care about the well-being or welfare of Amy after dropping her over the balcony of her own home. That goes to show who the defendant is a manipulative, selfish, callous murderer. His cell phone. Let me ask you guys, how much more do you have? Like five minutes. Okay, go ahead. His cell phone. The defendant's cell phone is taken into the possession of local law enforcement, and they look for all these text messages that we see, this voicemail, all of that, and it's nowhere to be found. It's because the defendant purposefully yeah, deletes those text messages. It, it, it was. It was just, suffice it to say, it was not on his phone. I'm sorry? Suffice it to say, it was not on his phone. 
Correct. Information. Okay. This information was not in his phone. And he's a smart guy. This was purposefully taken off Honor. of his phone. In objection. We were not allowed to argue reasonable inferences. Reasonable inferences, yes, but uh, 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 we had a, I think the court made a ruling with respect to that, so the court uh, characterized what you could say on that. Uh, sure. Yeah, so go that ahead. information was nowhere to be found on this phone. But we know that those messages were sent, those calls were made, but they were nowhere on his phone. Where did they go? How did they disappear? Think about this jail visit that he had with his two friends, Corey and Eigen, as well. Now, the tone of this jail visit has zero, zero reference to Amy's, any sympathy for Amy. They don't talk about Amy at all. And in the one reference that they do, there's no sympathy there. He doesn't care about her well-being whatsoever. And despite all the excuses the defense tries to bring about the tone of this call, about him joking around, laughing, zero sympathy for the victim, those are all excuses Ms. Bernstein Webb gives you excuses for the defendant's consistent bad behavior throughout this entire incident, including this jail call. He even says near the end of the call, I guess I'm officially a bad boy, right? This jail call goes to, is just a glimpse of who the defendant really is, and that is a callous, cold-blooded murderer. He doesn't care about anybody but himself. He's manipulative and entitled. And defense tries to draw a parallel between the defense's use of humor in this call and Hernando Chavez's use of humor when he's interviewed by the police to deal with his grief. But there's a substantial difference between Hernando Chavez and the defendant. And that is, Hernando Chavez did not kill Amy Harwood. And the defendant absolutely did. So it's totally inappropriate use of your humor. You've just been arrested for murdering someone you love and couldn't get over for over a decade. And this is how you sound in a visit between you and your two friends? Last slide, Your Honor, I promise. Motive. Right. The law states that having a motive may be a factor tending to show that the defendant is guilty. And the defendant absolutely had a motive here. In these text messages that he sends to Amy, they go completely unanswered. She answers once, setting those boundaries, saying she wants no contact with him, and she never responds to him after that. And that makes the defendant angry because she shut him out. She wanted absolutely nothing to do with him. And because she shut him out, he wanted to punish her. He wanted to punish her by killing her. Just take a look at that jail visit. Take into account how he murdered Amy. It was a brutal way to kill somebody and very personal. When you take that into account, it shows just how angry the defendant is. It shows the true glimpse into his motive. And that is he wanted Amy to suffer. Think about it. You saw the wounds to her head and her hands and defending herself. The defendant struck her in the face repeatedly, causing a nose fracture. Frankly, this was a beatdown. I just call it what it is. It was a beatdown. And then he strangled her to the point of unconsciousness, to the point of a weakened state, and it caused her to urinate all over herself. And then he threw her, or tossed her, dropped her over the balcony, plummeting to her death. And Amy screamed. Amy struggled. Amy fought for her life. Yet the defendant doled out his final punishment on Amy Harwick during that beatdown, during that strangulation. Instead of leaving her on the third story of her home, beaten and bruised, 
His final punishment was to pick up her body and drop her over that balcony. That was his true motive, to watch her suffer. And I ask you to hold the, dis hold the defendant responsible for his heinous actions because he's a callous, selfish, entitled and manipulative, cold-blooded murderer. So please find him guilty of the crimes of first-degree murder, burglary, and find true the special circumstance of lying in wait. Thank you. All right, let's have the uh, court for the bailiff, if you would, please. If you follow the story, you will take charge of the jury and keep them together, and you will not speak to them yourself, nor allow anyone else to speak to them upon matters connected with the case, except on order of the court, and when they agree upon a verdict to return them into court, also, you do solemnly swear that you would take charge of the alternate jurors and keep them apart from the jury while they are deliberating on the cause until otherwise instructed by the court to have begun. I do. Can I get a stipulation from counsel that the uh, jurors may be dismissed at all recesses without the presence of the court counsel or the defendant? Yes. Yes. All right. Bill? Uh, reporting time tomorrow, Judge, 930? 930. Okay, jurors, you go ahead and take your juror notebooks on the chairs, take your property, and we'll go ahead and give you instructions further tomorrow morning at 930. Have a good evening, ladies and gentlemen.